Um, right, so this is our quantum computer and it's uh, something we really approach kind of from a systems engineering perspective. Um, this is something that uh, really takes kind of a, a, you have to take a high level view um, to be able to operate. Um, but we can start from the very basic part, which is our qubit. We trap uh, ytterbium-171 ions, and they have these uh, two levels in the ground state that are hyperfine uh, levels that are split by 12.6 gigahertz. And so these um, will make up our qubit. And um, we can do what's called a T2 measurement, uh, where we kind of look at the coherence as time goes on. And in a long chain of these ions, we achieve over uh, four seconds. Um, and if one works uh, very hard, as the, the Kim group has, uh, you can even get uh, T2 in over an hour in ytterbium. Um, so these qubits are very long lived. So when we um, make any kind of superposition here, it survives for a very long time. Uh, as I kind of alluded to, we trap long chains of these ions. Um, so in this picture, this is a chain of ytterbium ions uh, fluorescing on the camera. And to do that, uh, we use these traps fabricated by Sandia National Laboratories. And um, you can see they have many little electrodes on them that allow for precise control of the potential above the trap where the ions sit. So they'll kind of be hovering above the surface. Um, and we load the ions here and then shuttle them over into the loading region. Okay, our detection of the qubit is done using a laser at 369 nanometers. So we shine um, the laser in and if the qubit is in this upstate, it fluoresces and we collect those photons. Um, so we can see whether um, the qubit is bright or dark. And um, this provides high detection fidelity. And we can do this uh, for each ion in the chain using a multi-core fiber. So there's one little fiber core in here for every qubit. Our qubit manipulation is done using a two photon Raman process with a pulse laser at 355 nanometers that's detuned from these excited P states. So uh, the ion absorbs from one beam and emits into the other, resulting in a transfer of population between our qubit states. And using this, we can control the, the quantum state of our qubit and execute our gates. In our system, we have individual addressing of up to 32 ions. And um, how this works is kind of each ion gets, gets its own um, beam uh, in one direction. So for the Raman process, we need the two beams. So one addresses the entire chain. And then uh, from the other side, we take a beam and split it into 32 beams and then control them individually using this acousto-optic modulator. So this modulator has 32 inputs, one for each beam. So we have full control over each one um, separately. Our two qubit gates are done using a spin independent force, which excites the motion of the chain. So you can see in this picture, we apply, um, we, uh, uh, apply the laser beams to two ions of our choice and tune the beams near the, the motion um, so the motion actually gets excited. And since um, we have this Coulomb repulsion between all of the ions, they all participate in this motion together. And so um, using that, we can create entanglement. Uh, and the, with these kind of faster gates that we use, we really are exciting all of these modes. Um, so it's important that at the end of the gate, um, all of the information is left in the spin instead of um, in the motion. Uh, so we're what we because what we really want is this x x interaction where the motion is completely out of the equation, and we do that by um, shaping the laser pulse that we use to optimize to um, have that closure of motion. Okay, um, so that those are kind of the components, and then of course, as I said, this this really is an entire uh, system that we have to control. So we have lots of uh, automatic control built in. In this example. Um, you can see an ion chain loading up. So we, we start with the ion over here in the loading zone and then shuttle it over and add it to the chain one at a time. So we can load your chosen number of qubits. Uh, we use a Python-based control card called Arctic that has pretty widespread use in uh, the ion community. 
And then uh, we also work closely with um, some industry partners to make sure that we have um, those parts that are, are super important to the system are very well engineered. Okay, um, so this is just kind of an overview of our current uh, sort of typical performance of our computer. Uh, and we currently work with uh, 13 qubits with all to all connectivity. Our two qubit gate fidelity is right around 99%. And our single qubit gate fidelity is over 99.9%. .9%. And then we have our, our small spam errors. Uh, so this is the, the system that we're going to be working with. And um, so now to go back to this idea of what we'd like to study, this monitored random circuit, we can, we can start to adapt it to the system that we have. So the first thing is that these unitaries on random pairs are now um, random XX gates on pairs of ions. Um, so that's the first thing. And then we're going to make another um, modification to this model where we add an extra uh, qubit here that serves as a reference. And um, this is because measuring the, uh, so what we'd like to, to monitor during this evolution is the entropy of the system, right? We want to know the, the entanglement that survives over time. Um, but measuring the entropy of this entire system is a very expensive operation, it requires um, measuring the entire density matrix. Um, and so what we would much rather do is measure the entropy of a single qubit. And so this, this reference qubit is initially entangled with the system um, and then doesn't participate in the evolution, but still serves as a, um, a measure of the entropy of the system condition on the measurement record. So that, that greatly reduces the kind of um, measurements that we have to do in order to observe the entropy. Uh, so now, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Um, uh, before you move forward, uh, you said that coherence time for your qubit is about one hour, or maybe even larger. Um, but since you have uh, interaction, clone interaction between qubits, you have also pair correlated errors, which in some uh, easiest possible processes equivalent to flip flop in a spin system. So. Uh, and if your um, one hour decoherence time is just for single qubit one in one in the entire universe, so do you have estimation for decoherence time, including pair correlated errors? Um, because you, I do not ask a question about environment because environment includes into decoherence times uh, as well, but the other flip flop the easiest possible uh, contribution to pair qubit errors are flip floppers, which actually should be here. So the, the spins are only coupled when we're doing the XX gates. Mm -hmm. When the lasers are on, that they're, they're coupled through the motion. And when those lasers are not on, the spin and the motion are not coupled. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't get any kind of spin flip errors due to Coulomb interaction. So you, you don't have theoretical model, which actually model you system and, and compute T2 time uh, for entire system. No, you, you only have well, estimation they, for a single qubit. They're not coupled. There, there is no okay. sense of this type of error. OK, thank you. Okay. Actually, can you just say again how this reference uh, bit um, is involved. I, I missed mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So what, what we'd like to do is look at the entropy of the system over time. So we're trying to see if the, um, entanglement is, is surviving and, you know, this, depending how many qubits are in the system, measuring the entropy, uh, requires many measurements. So let's try and avoid that. So what we're going to do is add this reference qubit. And at the beginning of, before any of the evolution happens, we entangle it with the system. So we create a bell pair between this reference qubit and a chosen system qubit. So now whatever uh, is happening to the entropy of the system is also happening to the reference because it's now entangled. Um, so so it, it, it sort of serves as, as like a flag, you can think of it. Um, and, and so by measuring just the entropy of the reference, we 
we know the entropy of the system as long as we have this, this measurement record to um, condition on. So we need some kind, we need some kind of information in order to, to do this. And that's, that's where this measurement record comes from. I guess I still don't understand how something like volume entanglement can be deduced from looking at a single reference qubit. Or maybe that you, you're not interested in that anymore. Somehow is that the point? Well, I guess um, it's my understanding that the, the mm, volume law entanglement is a, a dynamical property. And so it's, this, this gives us the kind of an entropy probe of the system. And then if we can show that it, it persists at, at long times, then that's what gets us the, the volume law entanglement. So I guess it's, it's not um, entanglement in space so much as entanglement in time that, that we're interested in. Okay, thanks. Can I just follow up? Uh, <laughs> Do, do you do you study the the behavior of the entanglement as a function of where the system qubit is sitting? Do you like sweep it across the entire system, or do you choose just one ion in the in the one ion in the system and the reference ion, and that's all you ever study, or do you are you do you have the ability to to vary the the system ion, the system qubit? Um, we always kind of make a choice at the beginning of which system qubit to entangle with the reference. Um, but, but we're only ever monitoring the entropy of this chosen reference qubit. Um, and the exact way we choose this, this system is kind of different every time um, on the ions, depending on the system size of the circuit. Um, and even the reference changes like which exact ion we might use. Um, but the, the the pictures it doesn't it doesn't really change. So you, you mean the 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 refer I mean if I'm thinking of a linear chain of ions, the reference ion is not necessarily uh, at the end of the chain. Right. But um since we have full connectivity of our gates, it doesn't really matter where it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. Um so Right, so, so now we uh, have one more thing to add to our experimental protocol for um, studying these, these systems. And that's the use of ancilla ions for the measurements. So in, a, in our current ion system, we measure all of the ions at the end of the circuit. And so with these ancilla, we use a deferred measurement uh, in order to actually monitor the system. Okay, um, so to kind of zoom out now and look at the uh, phase diagram of a system like this, um, we're going to add one more parameter. So this is the same P, the probability of, of measuring in each of, each of these time steps. Um, and then on the y-axis is Px, which is going to be the probability that these measurements happen um, in the x basis. So since our unitaries are xx, if we project into x versus z basis, this changes, of course, how the, the xx gates act on those qubits moving forward. Um, so it's, it's analogous to tuning the measurement rate. We can just tune the probability that we measure in x. Uh, and so if we, uh, on one side of this, we have, the, again, this coding phase. And on the other side, the failure phase, where um, at a, at a we're going to choose a given uh, probability of measurement, which is actually quite low, um, and instead tune the this px value. And what this does is constrains the number of measurements that are required, um, since we're at this this low measurement rate, uh, which constrains the number of ancilla qubits that we need. Uh, so this is what the the circuit looks like, for example, in a, a size six system. So we have our six system qubits, our reference, and in this case, three ancilla for measurement. Um, so at the beginning, we first entangle the reference with a chosen system qubit. Uh, we then scramble the system to start in a mixed state. 
and then begin the evolution where these unitaries are now XX gates on any uh, a random pair within the system. And then after that gate, we measure one of those qubits with some probability and um, continue the evolution in this way. And I'll, I'll get back to this um, UF in just a moment, but this is just an example of what these circuits look like. Okay, so the, the first thing we do with the experiment is to um, check the time evolution of a single instance of these circuits. So in order to study the phase diagram, we need to kind of sample the ensemble and measure over many, many random circuits. Um, but let's just start by confirming the expected behavior of a single instance. So uh, what I'm plotting here is time in terms of the number of XX gates in the circuit and then um, the entropy of that reference qubit. So in this example, um, you can see that the simulation are kind of hidden behind the experiment for the most part. Um, so as time evolves, the uh, system should, or the reference should, should stay mixed. Um, and we see that it mostly does. And as we get into these regimes with um, more and more XX gates, our noise starts to come in. Uh, and then in this example, uh, the, circuit purifies as we expect from the simulation, um, but just to some kind of uh, offset from the noise in the system. Um, but we, we have a clear separation between something that's mixed and something that's pure at these different time steps. And each one of these data points involves um, three different circuits because we need to measure the um, reference qubit in all three bases in order to reconstruct the density matrix and compute the entropy. Um, so that this axis here is the quantum entropy. Um, so, so really for each circuit, uh, experimentally, we're running three circuits for these three bases, um, which is a lot, quite a bit of overhead when we start to want to sample large ensembles. So in order to reduce this, um, we add this feedback unitary and um, uh, we can do this by simulating the circuits ahead of time to find the ones that uh, will be purifying and then find a uh, feedback circuit that um, rotates the reference qubit into the Z basis. Uh, and then we only need to measure once in the Z basis. So this reduces the number of circuits that we actually have to implement um, by one third. And now what we're measuring is really just a classical entropy. We're just uh, measuring uh, this outcome of a projective measurement in this deep basis. Um, okay, so, so now we can start to look at larger ensembles. Um, and this is the expected evolution for uh, the average over those ensembles of random circuits um, in the different phases. So in the coding phase, the entropy plateaus up here at the top and um, the system remains mixed over time. And then in the failure phase, uh, the entropy just drops off quickly. And then near the critical point, we have some, some kind of exponential decay. And so this is just shown for a single system size. We can also vary the size of the system. So in this case, we have, um, I'm just showing L equals four, eight and 32 system sizes. And again, we have the coding phase and the failure phase, but of course these have kind of different decay rates happening. And so if you look at um, the trend at a single probe time here, shown here, then what you see is that in the coding phase, the uh, entropy increases with increasing uh, system size. And we see the opposite behavior in the failure phase. Uh, so observing this, this type of scaling um, would be kind of a signature of, of these two phases. Uh, so that's what we're going to look for experimentally. And what we see is that the, so now we're, we're looking again at this classical entropy of the reference qubit. And um, we were able to achieve system sizes of four, six, and eight. And we see the, the first experimental evidence of these, of these different phases. So in the top, um, we have the, the coding phase, Px equals zero, where the entropy is increasing with system size, and then the opposite behavior in the failure phase where it decreases. And then we also uh, sample near the critical point and see it kind of level off. 
And each of these uh, data points in the top and bottom lines involve running 300 circuits. And in the middle, we have about 100. So in, in, uh, in total, um, sampling close to, to 1,500 circuits for this, this plot. Uh, hi, Crystal. I, I had a small question. Mm -hmm. um, so just to make sure I understand this. So SC here, does it, does it represent the entanglement in your quantum state? Um, yes, yes. So it, it's a kind of a, a roundabout way of, of representing the entanglement. I see, I see. And so this is uh, what we know of as the von Neumann or the Rennie entanglement? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so, since we're since we're looking at a classical quantity, it's closer to the von Neumann. But okay. um, you 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 can study this transition in in kind of uh, either of either of those parameters. Um, I see. So it's but, like it doesn't matter whether you take von Neumann or Rennie, you're still going to see this transition. Uh, yeah, and and that's something that that there's many theory papers on by our <laughs> collaborators um, mm -hmm. to this point. But this, this purification transition, as we call it, um, interestingly also happens at the same place as an entanglement transition. And the, the naming conventions are a little beyond me <laughs> as an experimentalist okay. to me. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of all the same. I understand, um, yeah. <laughs> but there are specific differences. Um, that are are quite subtle to me. I see. But, I see. Um, same idea. The same idea. Okay. Okay. And one more question. Um, so, in the simulation, um, so are you looking at the pure state entanglement here, or are you looking at the mixed state entanglement? Uh, so we are um, averaging over all the circuits. At the the so we we evolve the circuit to a given time, and then mm -hmm. end it and measure the entropy, and then mm -hmm. we do this for three hundred random samples, mm -hmm. and then we take the average of all of them. All right, so it's kind right. Of, it, it's averaging the pure and mixed together. So you know, in, in essence, you'll get either zero or one, and then and you get lots of zeros and ones, and then you, you take an average. I see, I see. Thank you. May I also ask two questions? Yes, hi, one. So, like, the two questions, very like, uh, simple. Um, what is the depth of the circuit? And the second question is, what is the average number of, number of measurements you perform for the system size 468? Um, so the depth of these circuits is about 20 XX gates, varies around that number, depending. Um, because they, they're random. Um, mm -hmm. And then in, in, in this model, we actually restrict the number of, of measurements to um, four or less. So in the, in the four and six case, you only ever get three measurements with the low rate that we have. And then in the size eight case, um, we limit it to four. And there are only um, occasionally ones that, that get thrown out from the ensemble that and and there's um, upcoming <laughs> more information about that okay, and what that you. does to the to the picture. Yeah. Okay, uh, Crystal, I ha I have one small question again. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. No, it's uh, okay. Uh, so this SC, um, so the way you measure to not uh, run into the issue of post selection, is it? Or does it not make sense here because um, you have a mixed state? Um, so I'm, I might have missed the middle of your question. I think maybe you broke so, up a little bit. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So I was asking that you're measuring this entanglement SC, right? Mm -hmm. So is so does this particular entanglement, like when you're measuring this particular entanglement? Do you run into the issue of post selection that people usually talk about when they talk about measuring entanglement entropy in pure um, space? That's a good question. So, um, in so in this model, um, if we were measuring the quantum 
entropy uh, directly, mm -hmm. um, we would need to post select based on the measurement record. However, um, I mentioned that we add this feedback, feedback circuit to the circuits mm -hmm. that purify. Mm -hmm. So we're essentially baking the post selection into the circuit itself. Ah, I see. So, okay. so we don't actually have to post select on the results. Okay, okay. So, and yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so I can see that I'm I'm close to my a lot of time here. Um, so I may have to just kind of skip the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We section. Can, uh, sorry, I won't interrupt. Oh no, it's okay. These are good questions. Um, we'll just have. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, so so um, this this plot I'm just kind of showing you can you can extend these these simulations to larger sizes and see the the results kind of follow the trend. Um, so let me just. Um, just you to give you a five minutes late, five or seven minutes late, so you should. Okay. Yeah, I'll try and just kind of wrap up. Um, so we we just kind of some idea about looking towards the future. What we'd like to do um, is work towards having longer time evolution uh, and actual mid circuit measurement, so we can use more of our qubits and um, look at larger system sizes. Uh, and these are the kind of things that we'll need in order to actually observe the critical behavior um, at this critical point. Um, and I'm going to skip the technicalities of how we could do that um, with the experiment. Uh, but just to give you an idea, what we'd like to do is look at this near critical behavior. It has a certain exponential decay. And uh, if we can probe this decay parameter for different system sizes as we tune, again, this probability of the x spacious measurement, then um, what you see here is a crossing of all the system sizes at a critical point. Um, and so if we can reach these deeper circuits, we can um, look at this, this decay parameter. And, and then we can see that the, this model has nice properties where when you um, uh, scale by the, the system size according to certain parameters, you get a, a collapse of this behavior. Um, so kind of, this is all simulations, of course. So looking uh, towards these, these system sizes, which this is only out to L equals 64, um, we're already looking at being able to see the, the critical behavior itself. Um, and these, these parameters that go along with the collapse are uh, kind of harken back to um, these ideas about percolation and error correction thresholds and um, have much more deep theoretical meanings. Um, and so it would be great to, to be able to probe this behavior. Um, so I, I just want to wrap up by uh, one more time mentioning our experimental team um, and then collaborate closely um, with Pradeep and Michael at University of Maryland. And uh, we are soon this summer moving down to Duke University. Um, so we're looking for lots of folks to come and join the new Duke Quantum Center. Uh, it's gonna be an exciting time down there, lots of experiment and theory going on. Um, so um, if you're interested, you should uh, send me a message or maybe we can talk in the gather town. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have time for one or two quick questions because we did start a few minutes late. Um, so I have a question while others tee up their questions. So what happens with, um, I mean, what's the deal with this feedback circuit? So in, in, the, in the pure phase, I guess the feedback circuit um, disentangles the reference um, and sort of sticks it in the right basis. Um, so you get no entropy when you measure it. What, what do you do in the mixture? No, phase? so it doesn't, it doesn't do any um, kind of disentangling. Mm -hmm. It, mm, well, so, so, so the idea is that you, we have the ancilla that are storing the, the measurement record. Mm -hmm. um, so we do some uh, two qubit gates to condition on that measurement record. To the so reference. you sort of conditionally, you conditionally flip the reference qubit based on the measurement outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. And then we, the, if the qubit, uh, the reference qubit is pure, then oh. it's pointing in some direction. Yeah. 
And so then all we're doing is is changing that so it points along the Z direction. Yep. And then we can measure it with one shot. But I mean, how do you know that if you if if you if you if you if you get a half and half entropy, how do you know you didn't screw up the feedback circuit and like accidentally uh, put we, the X direction? Um, we only add these feedback circuits to the ones we know will purify. And we actually look at what the state should be and then okay. add the, the circuit on. So okay, it's thanks. it's somewhat contrived, mm -hmm. um, but it it's one of the the pieces that makes it possible to do this at all. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, anything else? Questions from the rest of sure people have you. Could I just check Adam, um, what the on how you what the on what the ensemble of circuits is that you average over? Sorry, I know you said it already, but I no, it's okay. It's a um so the, the randomness comes from at each at you you create the circuit by evolving these time steps. And at each time set, you choose a random pair to do the gate on. And then you choose um, based on the probability of measurement whether or not to measure. And so um, you kind of create many, many instances of these circuits by evolving them according to these rules and then adding them to the ensemble. Okay, and the, the gates are these XX gates and what were the, what basis are the measurements? Um, so the, the, the measurement basis is, is what we tune. So it's either an X or Z depending on the, the, the probabilistic outcome of the choice at that time. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we're out of time now. So um, let's thank Crystal again. And, um, and I guess Miles is up next. So Miles, can you um, share the screen? Okay, hi everybody. Thanks so much for having me on um, this really uh, interesting workshop today. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about this um, recent paper that we put out called What Limits the Simulation of Quantum Computers? And the idea here is to um, think about these, um, think about recent experiments and, um, you know, uh, interest in random quantum circuits and ask what could you do with um, classical simulations, but which are approximate. So really focusing on doing these approximately. And um, this was work with uh, Yuching Zhu and Xavier Weintal. And I just wanted to highlight both of them because Yuching was actually an undergrad when we did this work. She's now a grad student at Cornell. And then Xavier was really kind of the mastermind uh, behind this work. So, so you know, have to credit him for a lot of the really nice ideas that we, that we came across here. Um, so, <clears throat> so first of all, by way of motivation, um, the motivation here was that um, a lot of us have you know, a significant interest now in um, recent experiments um, in quantum computing platforms. And um, one big reason why there's even more interest now is that it's appearing that even these near-term devices are getting really big and really coherent and may be able to soon do things beyond the reach of um, classical computers. And in fact, it's already been claimed that they can by this group at Google um, that published this paper in 2019 saying that they had pulled off a uh, calculation or a simulation that is, is well beyond the reach of what any reasonable classical computer running a classical algorithm, you know, or quantum simulation could actually do. And so this is called, you know, quantum advantage or quantum supremacy, the idea that there's some kind of task that you can actually do in a quantum computer that you could not do in a classical computer in any kind of reasonable time. Um, so now the actual task that they did is they said, let's um, take samples, let's take a lot of samples um, from a quantum state which is prepared by acting on something like 53 qubits um, uh, with a random quantum circuit. And they considered, they considered a particular class of random quantum circuits where you have, first of all, um, single qubit gates, which are chosen at random, but from a fixed set of types. So you have these, these like three different types and you choose them randomly. Then you have two qubit gates that are arranged in a certain fixed pattern. And these are of a fixed type. And importantly, they chose these very well. They chose the type it's some kind of modified I swap uh, gate. Um, it's not so important, but the point is they're um, full rank when viewed as a, as a tensor or a matrix. So this um, was something that they, they thought about deeply, clearly in advance, and it would make um, classical simulations even harder. And that'll, that'll come up again a little bit later. Um, so basically, they have a certain protocol for um, acting with a random quantum circuit on, a, on qubits, which have a 2D connectivity, and 53 of them, and they do something like 20 uh, layers or 20 of these cycles involving uh, single qubit and then two qubit gates, and then taking samples from the resulting state. Um, and then they, um, 
they did this um, with fewer cycles, fewer layers, and um, could you know, compare it to simulations to see that everything was working as expected and to estimate the time costs. And then by comparing to a particular um, very clever but exact um, classical simulation technique, they estimated that when they finally go to doing 20 layers, which they can do in the hardware, in the actual quantum device, that the corresponding classical simulations would actually take 10,000 years to do the same thing. Um, so that you know, certainly is well beyond anything you would consider uh, something reasonable to do on a classical device. But um, interestingly, just a few days after this, um, this work was, was published or, or talked about, um, IB, a group at IBM put out a paper actually saying that the same task could be in principle done using only two days of computation with a lot of additional um, memory resources. Um, also, I don't have it on the slide here, but, but pretty recently there's a paper exploring um, optimizing tensor network contraction ordering and using a lot of tricks to do sort of you know, exact transformation on tensor networks that said that this could be done on a single GPU card um, in something like 200 days. So which is you know, kind of at that borderline between what you could actually do and, and sort of would not be reasonable to do. So there are, these, there are these widely varying estimates of the resources actually needed to do this classically. So that you know, raises the interesting question, like what is really the true difficulty? These are hugely different numbers, 10,000 years, two days, 200 days. You know, what's the actual uh, difficulty of preparing this quantum state and then sampling from it? Um, and then one very important thing that was, um, I wouldn't say necessarily overlooked in this discussion, but kind of um, put to the side a little bit in the sense of comparing really apples to apples or apples to oranges was that the whole setting here was that the difficulty being talked about is the difficulty of doing an exact classical simulation. So really actually you know, implementing the circuit perfectly classically and drawing samples from that. Whereas um, you know, everybody would, would admit, including the, the team at Google that did these experiments, that's not actually what they did, right? So they didn't, they didn't really prepare the exact state. In fact, very far from it, they, they had a very tiny fidelity with the target state at the end, um, even though it was still quite an achievement to get that fidelity and to do what they did at all. Um, so still, is it really right to compare um, to uh, classical simulations would have to be exact and which use techniques that always scale exponentially in some kind of parameter, whether it's number of qubits, the number of gates of a certain type, uh, the depth or, or other quantities. Um, and, and aren't really allowed to lose fidelity on purpose in order to bring down the costs. So is that really the right comparison? So, so in our work, we were thinking, no, um, if, if the experiments lose fidelity, the classical simulations certainly also be allowed to lose some fidelity and make that same kind of trade-off. So it raises the question, um, what would be the actual cost of doing an approximate classical simulation? And then what are some kind of good techniques for doing um, classical simulations of quantum circuits approximately that we could use to um, to get some kind of you know, um, upper bound on the, on the time needed on a classical simulation. So, um, so we'll consider a particular family of approximate classical simulation techniques, which is basically tensor networks, matrix product states. Um, and interestingly, these can be run in a mode which is not quite the usual way of running them, but, it, but it's still very familiar to those who know this technique, um, in a way that is rigorously linearly scaling in the number of qubits and in the circuit depth. And that's just a rigorous statement. It's just set up that way. So the idea is that we demand linear scaling in the number of qubits and circuit depth. And the trade-off is that you get a, a small um, kind of controllable up to a certain point loss of fidelity at every step. So you go off of a cliff exponentially in fidelity, but so does the actual experiment. Um, and what you gain is you get linear scaling um, in the number of qubits and circuit depth, again, like the actual experiment. So it's almost like having a kind of very strange type of quantum computer in a little black box sitting on your laptop in that it has you know, very similar scaling characteristics in, in, in both the costs and the, the fidelity behavior as an actual quantum device in many respects. Um, although you know, the, the actual source of why it loses fidelity is very different. It's not really due to random noise or error. It's just due to sort of controlled truncations that we do. OK, so um, very briefly, because um, the limited time, I'll just, I'll just very quickly introduce what is a matrix product. Excuse me, I ask you one question. One sure. quick question, if possible. You, you're saying so. So you, you will tell how you model fidelity, but I understood that um, uh, this um, modeling fidelity in all calculations, it's not like uh, calculation includes uh, decoherence channels. It's like just some yep. some mathematical truncation, and even uh, noise um, uh, channel is not really physical source of decoherence. So, That's right. 
Okay. Yeah, because the philosophy here is that um, is that we're not really putting ourselves to the task of model a physical device as, as, as sort of realistically as possible, as much as do some in some way prepare a quantum state that's near a target state and sample from it, however we want to do that. So we can we can truncate any way we wish, we can make any kind of errors we want, as long as they're not too big. But they don't necessarily have to be uh, physically motivated or, or, or similar to the same errors that you would actually make in a device. That would be great too, but it's just not the task we set out to do. But it, it also depends not only on a, on a model of decoherence, but also on the actual model. It can be topological protection, it can be surface model, it can be Tory code model, or surface model is okay. So it also depends on a chosen model of quantum computation. That yeah, I guess it just depends on what you mean by it, because we're we're just not trying to um, to to model any physical system precisely here. And not um, and not algorithm. Okay. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. And so not a particular um, um, type of uh, quantum computation, like topologically protected or um, say based on a physical super, uh, superconducting qubit without channels of decoherence, whatever. So you don't have specific model of quantum mm -hmm. computation, just a process, mathematical process, right? Correct. Yeah, you could just okay. think of it in a way as a as a totally other model um, that's that's none of those and is a purely um, algorithmically motivated model. That's it's almost like we're trying to game to kind of game it a little bit, where we're saying of all possible ways of making errors, let's on purpose make errors which are the most favorable for classical simulation of a certain type. Um, so it's it's cheating very much on purpose, which is okay. exactly the goal. Yeah, okay. so it's sort of flagrant cheating, um, but, it, but, that, but sort of, again, because we're trying to exploit a loophole in what how quantum supremacy is defined, it's saying like, can you do a classical simulation that can prepare a state near this one and sample from it? And it doesn't say, um, but you're only allowed to make physically realistic errors. So we're sort of gaming that loophole and saying, let's make errors that favor our output. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that, I think it's a really good question because you could debate whether that's interesting, but we, we wanted to exploit that loophole basically. But I mean, it, it leads to, I think, a lot of interesting um, kind of tease up interesting future questions about uh, classical simulation and, and things. So thanks. Um, okay, great. So, um, so now very briefly on the technology that we're using here classically um, is that we're using tensor networks, matrix product states. So a lot of you know these, um, but I'm sure some of you are less familiar with these. So I'll just give a brief um, overview. So the setting here is that mathematically we're viewing um, the full state vector, the full quantum state that we're going to be acting on and, and preparing as a giant tensor. So the idea here is the tensor is all we mean here is a multidimensional array is just all the amplitudes of the quantum state gathered into a big, you know, multidimensional array of numbers. But if, if you actually tried storing and manipulating this thing, it has exponentially many components, exponentially many numbers in it that you would have to work with. So you'd have exponential costs in memory, exponential costs in time to actually work with this thing. So you can only push this up to, you know, you know, something like, you know, 16 or 32 um, qubits working this way. And we want to push more to like 53 or even hundreds in the 1D case. Um, so instead, what we'll do is we'll actually represent this tensor even from the beginning and all along in a, in a kind of quasi factorized form, or you could just say a factorized form. It's called a matrix product state. And the idea here is it's very similar to a matrix factorization, except instead of splitting a matrix into two other matrices, we do that over and over and over again, where we sort of split here, but also here and here and here and here. And then you get this kind of chain of tensors with three indices, or you can think of it as a chain of matrices that are layered together. Um, and we just start, we always start in this form and stay in this form all along. And we update the numbers inside these tensors. And we can also update the dimension of these indices. Um, and that's actually one of the most important concepts to, to understand the rest of the work is that these, um, new inter these new indices, which are called virtual or bond or link indices uh, that are introduced by this approximation can be adjusted in size. And the bigger they are, the more uh, quantum states we can represent accurately, the larger uh, portion of like the full Hilbert space we can actually capture. Um, so by having this number small, we get a huge computational advantage. Um, we can reduce our memory um, footprint from exponential down to just polynomial, just the square of this bond dimension. And also computations generally go like the cube of this bond dimension, so very, very mild um, cost and scaling. But we, in principle, don't lose anything. It's just a different way to organize the Hilbert space, because if we need to represent any state at all, we can always just grow this bond dimension up and up and up. And if we make it exponentially big, this precise value, we can actually represent any state whatsoever. So it sort of gives us a dial between representing any state whatsoever 
and then very special class of like less entangled states like like product states and things like that very easily and, and everything in between. Um, and now importantly, we can carry out algorithms on these matrix product states. So um, um, one of the, the algorithm that we'll be carrying out, it's, it's called uh, the jargon name for it is TEBD or Trotter gates, but it's as simple as this. It's that you take a single qubit gate and if you wanna act that on our state, that just means you take a matrix and you act it on one of these um, qubit indices or physical indices, which means you just contract these two tensors together and that can just be done exactly. So anytime we um, need to act with a single qubit gate, this is just a straightforward local operation on these tensors and we have no loss of fidelity or no approximation whatsoever. So that's, that's very nice. Um, the main approximation happens when we act with two qubit gates. So here we can actually carry that part out perfectly with no approximation. We just bring this two qubit gate thought of as a tensor onto these two other tensors and contract them all together. That's just some very simple you know, multiplication operation on the computer. But the problem is that it destroys our, our, our matrix product state uh, tensor network form locally. The form is defined by having one tensor for every qubit, but now we have a tensor that's sharing two qubit indices and we don't, we don't want that. If we kept doing that, we would very quickly go back to having exponential costs. So we have to do something to like come back to this matrix product state form. So what we can do is we can do this in a controlled way. We can treat this thing as a, as a matrix where these are the row indices and these are the column indices. And we can just put this into a singular value decomposition uh, you know, black box algorithm. And then we can compute the SVD, look and just keep the top chi um, singular values. Um, and then uh, we'll go back to matrix product state of bond dimension chi, and we just make some approximation. And that approximation is, is um, governed by how big were the other singular values that we threw away. And that's not something that we'll um, control per se. That'll just happen dynamically based on um, the gates that we act and the states that we reach and things like that. So we'll just accept a loss of fidelity when we do this, and we'll always work at a fixed bond dimension chi. We'll just say, no matter what, we'll keep the top chi singular values. And if that's all of them, we'll make no, no loss of fidelity. But usually that's just some of them, and we'll lose a little bit of fidelity as we do this. OK, then we go back to this MPS form. And so um, all these steps always just cost some fixed costs um, per gate. So everything is just scaling linearly in depth of circuit. And also it's just a linear scaling as we go back, up, back and forth across the qubits. So it's, it's rigorously linear scaling in the number of qubits as well. Um, so that's, that's the, the numerical technology that we're using very, very briefly. Um, so now let's apply this to, um, first of all, to one dimensional random circuit. So that's not what the Google experiment did, but this is where we did most of our work in sort of understanding um, the behavior of an algorithm like this when it's applied to random quantum circuits. So um, we consider random quantum circuits in 1D that are very analogous to the ones that Google did for 2D. Um, so we have these you know, random here, they're just par random single qubit gates, and then a fixed type of two qubit gates um, that we apply, okay, which are just control Z. So um, the way this is gonna look is that we um, uh, are just gonna represent our initial state very trivially as a matrix product state with bond dimension one, apply the single qubit gates, then apply the two qubit gates in the way that I said, and keep the top chi states, which at first will be all of them, so no loss of fidelity. Then do one qubit gates, you know, which is for free, two qubit gates, still keep the top chi, but now um, you know, we'll have a growing bond dimension because um, now the, you know, there'll be, at some point very quickly, there'll be more than chi states that we could actually keep. Um, and then eventually we'll start tr actually truncating and losing fidelity as we go and we go. But at the end, we actually have the entire pure state um, prepared by the um, random quantum circuit within some approximation, and then we could sample from it if we want and analyze it and compare, um, in principle, compare its fidelity to the pure. Excuse me, may I ask targets. one more question? May I ask you one sure. more quick question? Do you include mm -hmm. only single um, uh, errors or also pair correlated errors? Um, I don't think I um, understand when you say include, include errors. Yeah, include in simulation. So you can um, um, mimic um, errors in each single qubit, or you can also add a process which involves correlated behavior of, of uh, any two qubits, for example. Okay, I see, I think I see the question. So the answer is neither. So um, okay. we don't really model errors that way. So we just um, are acting with the single um, qubit gates and the two qubit gates. And then the errors that we have are very different from how they would arise physically. Um, you know, the errors we have is that we keep the top chi singular values in this approximation. It's a very mathematically motivated way of having the error. And, um, and if there's less, less than chi singular values that are non-zero, then we have no error. And then if there's more, we have, we have error. 
and then depending on the shape of the spectrum, we have we could have a lot of error. Um, and but but none of these errors are um, are sort of particularly uh, like I guess they, they have a kind of a two qubit flavor because they only come when we do the two qubit gates, but they're not really related to um, physical processes, you know, like like uh, two level systems in a real uh, system or coupling to any environment or anything. And then last question here. Um, how do you model um, uh, decrease in fidelity? Okay, exactly. So like, how do we actually keep track of it numerically? Yes. Of, um... Okay. That's what I'll talk about next. So it's a good okay, question. Thank you. Great. So, um, so first of all, for smaller numbers of qubits, we can just do the exact calculation numerically at just exponential cost and see how, how we do. Um, so we see that as expected, when we, when we work at different bond dimensions, so this is sort of different amounts of the state that we can possibly keep per step, we see at first we have no loss of, of error at all. Um, and then at, eventually we just cross over to exponentially losing fidelity with the target state. So here we just have the exact calculation compared to the um, simulations, which are the points. So that's, that's what we see. But it's, it's like how, what would happen in an um, unerror corrected quantum device too. So it's like we have a little uh, you know, simulation of, a, of an actual noisy quantum device in a sense on our laptop. Um, and then, you know, at the larger depths, the fidelity will go asymptotically exponentially with some characteristic um, error rate, some asymptotic two qubit gate fidelity that will be governed by the bond dimension that we decide ahead of time to keep. So how big of an MPS we allow ourselves to use. Um, so now we can't, of course, scale this up and always have the exact state to compare to to see what our fidelity is. So um, what we need some way to kind of wade into this um, exponentially costly territory, but still get a good estimate of what fidelity we have. So what we actually found empirically is that if you just take all the two qubit gates fidelities, which we can obtain at every step of our tensor network algorithm, which is, which is linear scaling, and just multiply them together, it actually matches very, very well to the true fidelity. So this very, very pessimistic like bound actually is, is tight. It, it really matches to the actual fidelity if we, if we actually have the real perfect state and do an overlap. So this gives us a way to um, get a quantity which normally you would think would be exponentially hard to get because you'd have to have the perfect state to compare to with only a polynomial effort. So we can just take those um, other states that we throw away when we do this, the SVDs, the, sorry, the other singular values, and then just analyze them and get this, these small F numbers and just multiply them together as we go and we'll know to very high accuracy, what's the true fidelity to the target state? So that's one of the outcomes of the work. And that's possible because we're in this random setting, basically. So that we have this kind of pessimistic behavior, but that gives us a way to get this quantity. So then that invites the question, OK, now that we have a way to know our fidelity at any time cheaply in these polynomial um, cost calculations, polynomial in the bond dimension, how far can we push this? That's, that's sort, of, sort of the other question. How high of a two qubit gate fidelity can we reach by put pumping this bond dimension up, 50 is very easy. So, you know, we could pump this up to many hundreds and work there and see how we could do. And we know that if we make the bond dimension exponentially big, then these um, two qubit gate fidelities have to eventually go to one. So, you know, but, but how far in practice can you actually get for reasonable bond dimensions that you can actually do? And, and crucially, does in, increasing these bond dimensions keep making an arbitrary improvement to how well you do? And the answer will be no, which is really interesting. Um, so let's let's see let's see that. So we find that um, there's a lot kind of going on in this plot, but I'll just highlight some of the curves in it. We find that um, when we're in a regime where the depth, the number of layers, is significantly less than the number of qubits, then we really can just arbitrarily make things better. We can just keep doubling the bond dimensions that we use, and the um, the errors we get on every two qubit gate will just go down and down and down very fast on a log scale here. So that's that's nice, and that's kind of ideal behavior that we would like to see, and it means that the classical simulations have a lot of power in that regime. But as we cross over to doing depths that are significantly bigger than the number of qubits, we start to see something like either a very kind of slow power law behavior, or maybe even actually a saturation or like a plateau. So then there's a question of which, which is it? Is it power law or plateau? It's power law, but it's actually a plateau in the bulk is what we found. So it turns out it's a power law. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself in my slides. But the power law is only kind of a finite size effect coming from getting the edges exact. So it turns out really our claim is that the bulk is we're getting kind of an asymptotic uh, plateau here where we're getting um, really diminishing returns where um, there's some kind of, you know, almost like a phase transition or crossover in the behavior where even if you keep increasing the bond dimension, 
you just can't recover any more um, fidelity. That somehow the random setting here and the depth here makes it so that you really have this, this behavior where um, you would have to start um, expending an exponential effort to actually really significantly improve the fidelities that you get at all. Does um, that mean that SVD so, as a, an approximation technique just breaks down? Somehow? Basically so. So what, what the way I'm understanding this is that it's like these, the singular value spectrum reaches a continuum limit. So you, get, you kind of reach a universal limit where, um, where there's some kind of characteristic um, fidelity that you hit. And, um, and just increasing the bond dimension by a polynomial amount doesn't take you out of that regime. And you really start to have to make exponential increases to have any kind of appreciable better approximation. So, so I think this is really one of the most interesting things we, we found. And this kind of ties into even outside of um, simulating quantum, uh, you know, like random quantum circuits and simulating quantum devices. It means in a way that we can really like, but this is something that I would like to kind of talk about with you all in the, in the gatherer session. Um, it's like a probe maybe that we're in like a volume law regime and something that's really beyond what MPS can capture that when we see this plateauing behavior. So, um, so our claim from these 1D findings is that, that for random quantum circuits here, as a, if you think of them as a stand-in for kind of all difficult quantum circuits in 1D, um, that if you have say an experiment that has two qubit gate fidelity below 99%, we can do your circuit and linear cost and the number of qubits in the, in the depth. That's, that's our like tentative claim or conjecture here. But then if, if the actual simulation, other simulation or experiment can obtain a Q, two qubit gate fidelity above 99%, we have to expend exponential resources in the bond dimension to actually match you. So then there's some, some kind of crossover here where now even for 1D circuits, MPS cannot give you a polynomial way to, to do a good job anymore. So that's sort of the main punchline of what we found. Um, um, mm -hmm. um, the, is this 99% number, um, it's what empirically you found for this class of circuits. Um, do you, how much do you expect that number to be different if you change your ensemble and or you know, if I'm really adversarial and can I like cook up circuits that could be really hard? Or, or I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. asking the question, now, but I know that uh, uh, one one thing to say is that you are by applying random circuits, you're you're doing the worst possible thing you can to entropy. So you might hope you're you're doing the worst things you can to your MPS. But anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I really like that question because that's that's kind of the direction I was thinking about it next in terms of what would be interesting to do. So first of all, I definitely want to emphasize you know conjecture here because because you know are random quantum circuits really the hardest? And then importantly, um, what is what are some peculiarities of this class that we did? Um, so one of them is that all the gates are local. So um, you could definitely do worse if you had, you know, three qubit gates or many qubit gates, which, you know, in real devices, you can really do things that act on all the qubits at once. Um, so that's one way around what we're doing. Um, so I think, I think that's probably the main one that I would guess. Um, it's, but it's really just a conjecture. And I think that's an interesting point of discussion. And then the other thing would be, you know, there's probably a lot of classes of circuits that are, are easier in very specific ways. Like if you had, you know, Clifford, circuits, we know that would be way on the other side of probably what's much easier to simulate. I mean, it's, it's known to be polynomial. Um, so then it'd be interesting to make these kind of finer gradations of different types of circuits that um, have this kind of crossover or transition with respect to NPS simulations run in this way to see what is the number for them. And I should mention this number is kind of rough. It's, it's including that we get a certain number of layers always for free, um, then finally go into this regime so, so the actual asymptotic fidelities are not 99, they're more like nine, I'll show them in a minute, but they're basically like um, either 96 or 93, they depend on the type of two qubit gate. But um, so the 99 is kind of combining a certain number for free followed by a bunch of these um, up to a certain depth that's equal to the number of qubits. So that's one other detail. Okay, so um, I think I'm uh, running out of time, but I just wanted to highlight um, that the paper includes a kind of a tentative theory, like a you know physicist proof or something of why this behavior may really be a plateau and not just a slow power law. Um, so the plateau is shown in this figure where when we finally go to very large depths and um, only consider fidelities in the bulk and stay away from the edges, this we, we really see we can keep getting these things that look like power laws in the bond dimension flatter and flatter and flatter and really almost looking totally flat. 
And that's, that's further supported by a theory that, that Xavier put forward in the paper. Basically, the idea is that if we suppose that every layer we apply maximally randomizes the entries of the tensors, which it doesn't, but if we just say that, you know, for the sake of the theory, then we could argue that the singular values after the SVD will approach a universal distribution. This is just kind of a random matrix theory motivated argument so that the fidelity afterward can, can finally become independent of chi in this case. So then one way to understand this is that it's like keeping a larger bond dimension instead of chopping off more of the tail is just squishing more and more singular values into some kind of uh, scaling form whose integral has like a fixed value. So it doesn't really buy you anything more. It's just packing in more singular values into some shape um, and taking more of a continuum limit. Um, so I think this is, this is kind of neat. So um, basically, very briefly, just to give you a flavor, you, you can come up with this, this um, argument by saying, let's just assume after one of these layers of random quantum circuit that the entries of each MPS tensor are drawn randomly in some way. And then um, we take some kind of fixed two qubit gate type here this isn't random, this is just some fixed type like control Z, act on it, and then um, this will double the number of um, non-zero singular values, um, you know, compared to the original number, which is the, fixed by this bond dimension chi. So then we'll, we'll just always be throwing out half of them. And then we can observe a um, collapse to a scaling form, which is just conjectured based on random matrix theory to have this form. And this is just an empirical observation. So you can just plot them and see that they fall into a scaling form. And then if you just plug the scaling form into the exact formula for the two qubit gate fidelity, you can just do a change of variables and get chi out of the formula. That's, that's the whole argument basically. So because you have this appearing, you have the um, singular values appearing in the numerator and the denominator, you pull chi out of the integral and it just cancels. So the idea is that eventually you get to some limit where even if you increase chi, your, your fidelity doesn't change. So chi doesn't matter. Although we know that eventually if chi is exponentially bigger, things have to become perfect. So this can't always be the case, but this is sort of the case across a very wide range of one dimension after a certain kind of set in period or something. And then this argument depends on some details of the class of two qubit gate that you have, whether it has um, two non-zero singular values or four, and it relates to what number you get in this, in this argument. Um, that's, that's basically the argument. So then um, I won't spend much more time on, on the talk, but I just wanna say that in the paper, we also considered finally two dimensional circuits that are of the type um, that Google considered and wanted to see if we could push our technology uh, further there. And the main trick is um, that we grouped qubits together in the MPS. So we use matrix product states that are of a modified form where each tensor now carries a large number of qubits instead of just one. And um, that means more of our gates, including many of the two qubit gates can now be done with, it. although we have an exponential cost now in, in our calculations that we can control, um, we can, have a lot of steps where there's no loss of fidelity at all. And basically the punchline is if we consider control Z gates, which are lower rank, which is not what Google did, we can actually get to the same asymptotic fidelities that would match their result. So if they had done control Z gates, we could have matched them, but they were smart and they didn't, they did a different kind of gate that's full rank. And so we, we couldn't beat them, but we were sort of on our way. Um, and then we ran out of steam at about a bond dimension of you know, a few hundreds. But if, in principle, if we could go to thousands bond dimension, maybe we could reach them unless something plateaus here. Um, so that's basically um, all I had to say. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. Um, Soon one looks like you have a question. Yeah, I do have just a question. Unmuted. Uh, you just unmuted, that's fine. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Soon one, do you have a question? I do have a question, but how oh, did you? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, Miles, I I'd like to thank you for a nice talk, but I'd like to challenge your conjecture because okay. uh, I'm not I'm not fundamentally obstructing to it. However, I think the conjecture is too strong because it's uh, it's about any noise circuit. But in fact, you are truncating like small you know shimmy coefficients. Any mm -hmm. quantum circuit where this like truncated shimmy coefficient becomes relevant at a later time will inevitably be truncated in your algorithm. Therefore, you're saying, I think- You're saying that certain like Schmidt states what we throw out could become important later? Yeah, when I can design such a circuit in principle. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Right, therefore, you're, I mean, the fact that you are systematically truncating the small coefficient could be nice for a certain aspect, like for the generic circuit, but not, mm -hmm. for, the, not for the tailored like circuit. So maybe you should want, you want to 
the drops and stochastically choose a certain shumi coefficient and then drop rather than choose the smallest one because this actually addresses an attack to your hacking method. Oh, that's it. Yeah, you know, there actually are, um, there's, a, there's a nice sampling algorithm that's been rather kind of overlooked and underused by um, MD Ferris, um, where, which is exactly does that. It's like you sample from the Schmidt values and you keep chi of them at random weighted by their size rather than just always the top chi. And if you do this over and over again, you still actually will, uh, you know, it's still an unbiased way to get something about the target state. So in fact, that could not only be harder to attack in the way you said, but it could even be better than what we did because we could, at a very light cost of just running our calculation more times, we could even recover back some of the stuff we lost rather than it's gone forever. So that would be kind of a neat uh, extension. Um, so I agree, although I would, I would say that that, the adversarial circuits, of, I, I would guess the adversarial circuits you're thinking of though, might be very bizarre and kind of non-local, however, because they might have to make these kind of mini body Schmidt states that, that would not be a circuit someone would come up with in an experiment or would easily implement. It doesn't make what you're saying incorrect, I don't think, but it, if one sort of limited the conjecture to like circuits people are really considering doing on a real device, say, or it, however that could be defined. Actually, I would say those circuits are interesting circuits because those are not described by, say, semi-classical descriptions, or rather the quantum interference becomes very strongly relevant at the later stage. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, I think it's starting, like, figuring out what circuit leads to the loophole of your algorithm may be actually interesting from a different perspective. Great, yeah, I think it's a really interesting discussion to keep, to keep having. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch more questions, so let's, let's deal with them and then go together. Um, I think Igor has had his hand up first. Okay, so I, I would like to ask a follow-up question. Uh, I understand that the, um, the engine of your um, uh, uh, classical simulations, the tensor network, if you will add uh, any kind of generic interaction between uh, qubits, will your um, uh, statement about Plato survive? Is it, so I uh, the main question about uh, the Plato? Yes, so how general this mm -hmm. uh, observation mm -hmm. is. Oh, so you mean, say so you say interaction, say something like a two qubit gate, but which any, acts arbitrarily any, far any away. generic interaction, whatever you can allow you to do within your tensor network approach, uh, any generic interaction, do you plot or survive? Uh, no, we, I, or not, probably not in the same, it won't be the same plateau with the same number here, 99, that would characterize when it begins, um, or, or that, you know, or what the typical losses on the plateau. Basically, no. I think this is specific to one D circuits um, because we didn't we didn't see the same behavior when we did the two D circuits. And the way we do the two D circuits is very much like what you said. We we do the two D by by snaking or zigzagging the MPS through. Then local gates in two D become non-local in this one D geometry, and then we don't see the same behavior. So there may be an analogous behavior that we could also quantify for MPS, or at least probably for like. 2D tensor networks like PEPs, but it, it would be different. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, Dean. Uh, yes, uh, hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the uh, nice talk. So yeah, I had a yeah, question about the, uh, the 1D uh, stuff you're talking about here. So uh, you mentioned how you had these uh, kind of plateaus appearing and how you have had this uh, kind of uh, unfavorable uh, scaling of the entanglement. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering uh, at all if this kind of, this whole kind of analysis would be applicable with say a kind of multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz for the wave function instead, mm -hmm. and if that would kind of improve the, uh, the behavior of the, uh, what you're seeing here. That's a good question. I mean, I think it would, it certainly could. I certainly could. So I think it's worth um, looking into that. You know, and I say could, because I'm just trying to be careful. I don't know if it would um, just change the numbers and make it so that this number gets higher, this 99, or would it, I mean, it certainly would make the number higher, I think, but would it also change it qualitatively? I don't know, but I think it's, it very much could, I think, and it's really worth thinking about it and looking into that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, Brayden. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering what happens if you do the exact same calculation, but um, you start with a density matrix representing, say, the exact same pure state, but, you know, but now you make the density matrix of the pure state, um, because then the target state is 
exactly the same if you did everything exactly, but with truncations in the like matrix product operator language, the truncations are doing something different to the state um, than in the matrix product state language. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then I guess um, maybe your question is motivated by that you can technically keep you know volume all states efficiently in these in, in these MPOs. Well, yeah, yeah. The density yeah. matrix may just become you know thermalized to a infinite temperature density matrix. I mean, uh, certainly if you start with a pure state density matrix and you do truncations, it won't be a pure state density matrix after truncations anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that might it might just heat up to infinite temperature or something like that. Um, that's yeah, it's I think it's a great idea. I mean, I, I don't know if I can say too much intelligent about it, um, other than I think it's very interesting because it could be very different from what we saw. And then on the, the pitfall could be what you may well know that there could be this this mountain you have to climb first before you come back down to a regime, like similar to what you see when you do real time evolution. Although here the goals are a little different. And so maybe that is not a problem because we're not so much trying to um, keep a really high fidelity all the time. We're actually okay with just losing it. And it's just a matter of how quickly. So, um, so maybe it could do a lot better. Yeah, that's interesting. Eugene? Sankhya was first. Oh, really? All right, Sankhya. Uh, hi, Miles. Uh, so, uh, I, I had a question like uh, in the two qubit operations, especially this was, I read read this in the paper. Um, so when you do the SVD like uh, of, uh, of the MPS, like USV dagger, so the, so the, and you have the N plus Nth one qubit N being on the left and the N plus one being on the right. Um, so e, e, uh, in the paper, like it said, like you update the Nth, Nth qubit as uh, U times S and the n plus one is just the v dagger. Uh, mm -hmm. So this this is like so. Is there a particular reason for choosing this instead of like just doing the symmetric u square root of s, uh, updating the u square root of s with m n and square root of s v dagger the m n plus mm -hmm. one? Yeah, it's a good question. So this is a really it's a technical point, but it's like an important technical point that um, it actually it's not important at that step. So if you do it at that step, everything is fine. So what you said this more symmetric one. But it, it has a significant effect on the next step. So on the next step, if you haven't done it the way we did, um, which is for, for people in this, this area, meaning um, a, a stay in this what's called an isometric or canonical form, um, which is we're pushing all the singular values over, then on the next step, the indices coming out of that tensor where they're merged won't uh, label orthonormal states anymore. They'll label some states that have uh, varying norms and things. Um, so then the truncation there will be locally optimal, but globally suboptimal. And so, so, the, so the correct choice is to move all the singular values over in the direction that you're going. And then you get the best possible um, compression. If you don't, you, you still can get a good compression, but it becomes less controlled or kind of uncontrolled at that point. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, the Dean. So I think uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether my question is echoing something that Dean uh, uh, asked earlier. Um, is there a relationship between this plateau, well, maybe only in one dimensional cases, and the second uh, tensor renormalization thing where you have to look at the environment and not just trust the local SVD to do the do its job? Hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I'm just learning this stuff now and I, I finally understood how SVD can go wrong, <laughs> you know, just understanding the second renormalization and we can talk about this in gather. Yeah, I think here. I think I think it's a I think it's like a good question, but it's a maybe a better question for systems of loops. Um, so there's something kind of special about MPS, which is that they're trees. And I think here the idea is that because we can always do this isometric form that Sankhya was, you know, his question mm -hmm. related to, and because SVD is known to be the optimal low rank decomposition um, of a matrix in, that mm -hmm. we're here is turned into a tensor. Then I think in that sense you could probably argue that you can't do better um, than this local operation as long as you have this isometric form. When you have when you don't have it, then you can mimic having it to a certain extent by having environments, um, and then that can kind of recover more um, fidelity. But I think here I don't know if we can do better um, unless we like you know left the class of NPS and say went to density matrices um, like like I think it was Braden who asked about right. or something right, else. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we're about out of time, but it looks like Simon has another question. 
Why are you playing? <laughs> yeah, actually, no, no, you, was... keep, you, you keep turning your video on unmuting yourself. So what am I supposed to infer from that? <laughs> oh, I see, I see, I see. Um, so my, actually, I do have a question. You're right. You're smart. Um, so this, I was wondering, but it's a too vague. So I was like, uh, not there. To All right, let's move together then. Yeah. yeah, maybe on the discussion session. Yeah. All right. Um, so, all right, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, Vadim um, has provided a link to the, to the gather for the poster session and such um, in, the, in the chat. Um, yeah, there it is again. So um, please do follow that and see you at the poster session. All right, and we'll meet again this room in an hour or so, bye. plateau, well, maybe only one dimensional cases. And the second uh, tensor renormalization thing where you have to look at the environment and not just trust the local SVD to do the do its job. Hmm. I mean, yeah, let's see. I'm just learning this stuff now. And I, I finally understood how SVD can go wrong. You know, just understanding the second renormalization and we can talk about this in gap. Yeah, I think I think I think it's a I think it's like a good question, but it's a, maybe a better question for systems of loops. Um, so there's something kind of special about MPS, which is that they're trees. And I think here the idea is that because we can always do this isometric form that Samkhya was, you know, his question mm -hmm. related to, and because SVD is known to be the optimal low rank decomposition um, of a matrix, and over mm -hmm. here is turned into a tensor. Then I think in that sense you could probably argue that you can't do better um, than this local operation as long as you have this isometric form. When you have when you don't have it, then you can mimic having it to a certain extent by having environments, um, and then that can kind of recover more um, fidelity. But I think here I don't know if we can do better um, unless we like you know left the class of NPS and say went to density matrices um, like like I think it was Braden who asked about right. or something right, else. Right, right. Okay, thanks. So, all right, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, Vadim um, has provided a link to the, to the gather for the poster session and such um, in, the, in the chat. Um, yeah, there it is again. So um, please do follow that and see you at the poster session. Particular uh, dimer of bell pairs, which is implemented natively if you just had open boundary conditions in your lab. So, so this is what you would normally do when you have a finite chain, and the last qubit at the edge interacts with its, you know, its right neighbor, but it doesn't have a left neighbor, so it kind of skips one, skips one half period, and that just implements natively this particular initial state, which is a short range entangled, transitional invariant initial state, which is, uh, you know, a reasonable choice. So if we're happy with that, we can just implement it for free and move on. And that leaves us with the final uh, question, which is what to do with this final state. So this final state exists on a time-like surface which sort of means that there is a particular qubit in your chain uh, at the edge, uh, which as a function of time realizes the various qubits in this many body wave function, which is a kind of a strange uh, thing to, to wrap your head around. And we would like to turn it into something that's more conventional that, that you could analyze, you know, preparing the lab and then do measurements on and, and so on. So the trick uh, we propose to do that is to basically insert a bunch of ancillas. So, add some qubits to your system, uh, also in, in bell pair states like this, and then act on them with this array of swap gates. So whenever two of these word lines are crossing, that is a swap gate. It's taking in two qubits, exchanging their positions, and then letting them evolve further. Um, and if you do this, you'll see that every one of the qubits in the many body wave function that you, that you had uh, realized, which I'm marking here with, with colored bullets as, for, as a guide to the eye, uh, you can see that all of them end up reflected into this final surface. So this is now a, a space-like surface, a conventional sequence of qubits in, in the lab, uh, where the wave function is just reconstructed exactly. So you can see for each one of these bullets, for example, this one, you can trace its trajectory through space-time, and you can see that it ends up exactly where it's supposed to be. So we call this um, sort of teleportation, and there's, there's two reasons. One is that it sounds cool, but the other deeper one is that it's inspired by the quantum teleportation protocol, where 
you have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they share some entanglement in the form of a bell pair. And by doing measurements on one subsystem, Alice can basically teleport her state over to Bob's side, which is kind of reminiscent of what's going on here with all of these uh, bell states that are being uh, swapped between the, the system and the ancilla. And then you do some measurements at the end of time in the system, and you end up with the interesting state on, on the ancilla side. Good. So that's um, that wraps it up. So this is how you would do it in the lab with modest, you know, reasonable resources. So two qubit unitary gates, which you you have. So either the these boxes that are the model dependent gates you might decide to, to implement, and these swap gates, which are also simple uh, sort of uh, gates that belong to the conventional toolkit. Um, a polynomial number of ancillas, and then really the more costly part is the sequence of post-selected measurements at the end. Which in the worst case scenario, yeah, you just have to uh, you have an overhead that scales as two to the L, basically. Uh, which, which you know, it, it's bad, but it's not as bad as the if you wanted to do this thing for a generic unitary measurement circuit, you would have a number of measurements that would scale as the space-time volume of your circuit. So here we have a zero, like a vanishing density of measurements in space-time. Um, Good. So, so hopefully, uh, with that, I've convinced you that this is a thing that it's worth uh, thinking about, and then that you know it's not completely uh, theoretical. It could, could be done uh, within some constraints. Um, and then the question is, what to, um, you know, what can we learn from this in terms of entanglement scaling in in steady states from these non-unitary circuits? So probably the program would be to use the body of knowledge we have about entanglement growth in unitary dynamics. So given a unitary circuit, initialized in a product state, uh, how does entanglement build up about some, some cut in the system? And we know that there is a whole variety of behaviors uh, that you know, we summarize here um, on a spectrum from less entangling to more entangling, which all of these can be realized within some class of models. For example, these uh, Floquet kickizing chains as a function of, you know, as you tune the couplings, make them disordered or clean. Um, you could have a, a free system, which is Anderson localized, and it could give you no entanglement growth beyond the constant. Uh, then you could turn on interactions, make it many body localized, and you would have slow logarithmic entanglement growth. You could then cross into a thermal phase, and initially, very close to the transition, you would see this sub-ballistic entanglement growth with a, with a power between zero and one. And then eventually, you will become chaotic and have this ballistic entanglement growth. And then possibly, you may realize these special maximally chaotic dual unitary points where entanglement goes with the maximal velocity. So the program would be, given this variety of behaviors in S of T, you know, do they translate or how do they translate into corresponding behaviors for the spatial scaling of entanglement in the duals of these circuits? And you know, the intuition is simple, right? You're, 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 with this duality, you're exchanging time with space. And so it, it's, it's Sort of a natural guess to make that the behavior of entanglement in time should have a relationship to the behavior of entanglement in space on the other side of the duality. So here comes the uh, more technical part of how we relate the two. And again, the problem is to look at this kind of circuit, which is what I've built up before, uh, where we have these unitary gates in the bulk and then these peculiar boundary conditions here. Uh, and then we're trying to study the state that is prepared at the right hand side. And in particular, we're focusing on entanglement of a subsystem, and we're going to call A, um, which has a finite size and is embedded in a, in, in a, in a system uh, that's much bigger and that we're going to take to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and again, this is to be compared with the more conventional entanglement cut in a unitary circuit, which would be something like this. And as you can see, these two things are identical in the bulk, but these are just drastically different boundary conditions, which can have a really, like, it's, it's not super clear beforehand how the two um, calculations should be related. Oh. Is there a question? No. Okay. Um, so because the state you prepare here is pure, so despite its non-unitarity, you have a pure state. So the entropy of A really is also the information that's shared between A and its complement A bar, because there is no third party to share information with. And so uh, the question is how much of the information that you have in A um, sort of is, is shared with its complement. And um, here there is a strong simplification that shows up if you take the thermodynamic limit where the size of the complement is taken to infinity. So, so the top of this circuit is, is pushed up to infinity um, because in that limit, all the information that crosses this cut at B 
ends up in a bar. Sorry, there's some noise. Okay. Um, so technically, we can show that there is an isometric mapping between the qubits at B, that is this space-like entanglement cut, and these qubits in a bar, which is this time-like surface. So an isometry is just like a unitary between a smaller space and a bigger space, basically. Um, and, and unitaries don't affect entanglement. So, so what we can do is just elide all of this uh, big chunk of circuit and, and be left with a much smaller problem. Uh, that's, that's basically calculating the information that's shared between A and B. So again, that's fine because then all the information that makes it to B will make it up through a bar. So that's, uh, that's the simplification that we, that we use. And at this point, we have a pure state on this peculiar bipartite system AB, where A is time-like and B is space-like. Uh, so that's a very strange state, but you know, it, it's a perfectly legitimate tensor network. We can just think of it at that level. And we want to ask about the entropy of this subset of qubits on A. So uh, again, because the state is, is, is pure, you can trace out either one of them, or A or B, and it's going to be most convenient to trace out uh, A, actually. So doing so, you know, to get the, the reduced density matrix on B, you have to, as always, uh, build up build up your uh, density matrix by taking a copy, copy of the cat, a copy of the bra, and doing a partial trace. And diagrammatically, this becomes the following. So you have two sheets. Um, the top one will be the cat. The bottom one, the shaded gates in the back, will be the bra. And you are uh, doing a partial trace on A, which connects these legs at that particular surface in, in this manner here. Um, and this now gives you an appealing um, dynamical interpretation because um, basically, um, if you think of this as time goes on, what is happening to this particular qubit at the edge is that it's being constantly traced out and replaced by the identity. So when you are here and, and moving forward in, in laboratory time, you're being traced out, which is this loop here, and then you're being replaced by an identity, which is this loop here. So this process as a whole is known as the fully depolarizing channel, which is a familiar uh, entity in you know, quantum information. It's, it's kind of like the, the bad guy. Um, and so this lead, leads us to this final uh, technical result, which relates entanglement on the two, two sides of the duality. So on the one hand, we have entanglement uh, in these non-unitary circuits uh, and how it scales with the size of the subsystem. And on the other side, we have entanglement uh, basically in, in, in laboratory time under unitary dynamics and this decoherence acting at the edge. So this produces a mixed state, which has a certain amount of entanglement as decoherence, we call it. And that entanglement is what you care about in terms of relating it to uh, the entanglement scaling of the non-unitary circuit. Um, and particularly we care about the limit in which, uh, you know, we care about steady states. So you take this edge of the circuit all the way up to infinity um, that uh, simplifies the, this uh, equation further and tells you that basically the spatial scaling of entanglement in these steady states equals the amount of entropy that you can inject as a function of time by perturbing the system at the edge. So, so again, two, two key points here in this uh, duality. One is perhaps the more expected one in which you are exchanging the roles of space and time. So here you have this T equals uh, L twiddle, and it's this exchange of space and time. The other one is this decoherence, which was instead less expected. It's more of a quirk of, of this mapping, which, which is in, has interesting consequences. And I should briefly say, if you don't like to think about quantum channels and decoherence, you can also think of this latter uh, case as simply a cut in a very particular unitary circuit in which everything that's to the right of the cut is simply swap gates. This is, again, the kind of trick we saw earlier in building up the circuit. Um, and what this does is that it takes information that crosses the cut and just radiates it off to infinity without giving it a chance of ever turning around and, and entering the circuit again. So any sort of interference effect where you have information that, that travels out of the cut and that eventually comes back, that gets killed off. And so that gives you significant differences in the behavior of entanglement um, with respect to the more conventional entanglement growth in unitary circuits. Okay, so in the remaining 10 minutes, I'll try to uh, go over you know, some, some of the interesting uh, results we get with this. So again, going back to this range of uh, entanglement growth behaviors in time, uh, 
with this mapping in hand, with this space time duality mapping in hand, we can now uh, see how the entanglement scaling in space behaves in these dual circuits. And the results we find look like this, which to zeroth order, uh, you get what you expected, which is that time gets replaced by space in the dual circuit. So, you know, for example, log t becomes log l, which is intuitive. Uh, and a first key result here is that this uh, sub-ballistic entanglement growth, uh, where entanglement grows as t to the alpha with alpha between zero and one, gets you this new family of, of steady states whose entanglement growth, uh, whose entanglement scales in space as a fractional power law, which is genetically not seen in uh, many body unitary dynamics, where it's either volume law, log law, area law. Uh, but a second point is that uh, this isn't quite so one-to-one. -one. There are some interesting differences. One is that there is no area law phase, uh, so we can rule it out, basically. So even in Anderson localized circuits, where you would have expected to find area law steady states, you instead get a logarithmic divergence. And then these logarithmic terms pop up more or less across the board, and you also encounter them in chaotic circuits. So in duals of chaotic circuits, you get this volume law term, but, but it's accompanied by this subleading log correction, which is non-thermal. So you get an interesting uh, non-thermal volume law entangled phase that is related to the volume law phase found in unitary measurement circuits. Good. Uh, so starting from uh, localized circuits, uh, you can see, you, you know, you, how can we understand the, uh, the emergence of, the, of this log entanglement? So um, imagine a Floquet Anderson localized circuit in which you have uh, your, your Anderson orbitals that are exponentially localized at various positions in, in your chain. And now you're going in and you're perturbing them at the edge. So you're taking the edge qubit and acting on it with this erasure channel at all time steps as your dynamics proceeds. So doing so uh, not only depolarizes the qubits that are, that are near it, but it eventually depolarizes the entire chain. Just that it takes a really long time. The reason is that if you're very far away, like if you're, if you're, a, if you're an Anderson orbital that's n sites away from the edge, then you have an exponentially uh, decaying tail that overlaps with the site that is being decohered. And that amplitude is what eventually decoheres the orbital. And, and so it takes an exponentially long time to do so. But when you put it all together, it gets you this um, logarithmic growth of entanglement in time. And then across the duality, it gets you this logarithmic scaling in space. Um, and this phenomenology persists in MBL, basically. We have numerical simulations where it's uh, quantitatively the same behavior. And the argument is that just the Anderson orbitals are replaced by local integrals of motion in the MBL phase. Good. Uh, so then if, you, if we crank up the interaction strength, eventually we cross into um, um, a thermal phase. But um, when we are still very close to the transition, we have strong disorder. And the growth of entanglement doesn't immediately go ballistic. It starts off as a sub sublinear power law. And this is because of a distribution of rare uh, strongly disordered regions that are basically localized and slow down your, uh, your entanglement growth. So, this is a phenomenon that's a bit tough to study in microscopic models because intrinsically it involves um, long length scales and rare regions, so it's, it's a complicated thing. But this is where coarse grained circuit models come to the rescue, and particularly this circuit model by Adam, uh, Nahum, and Ruman and Hughes from a few years back, where the idea is to capture the behavior of these uh, bottleneck regions by picking a different entanglement rate for each bond in your chain. So given a bond, you sample some rate gamma from some distribution, that's, that's a power law. And then that rate is fixed and you're drawing unitary gates um, at that bond with that particular rate. So if the rate ends up being very, very small, then it means that at that particular bond, you are for the most part doing nothing, like it's just the identity over and over. And then every one over gamma, you're dropping some entangling gate. So that models in, a, in an effective way, the fact that that particular region uh, is you know is a bottleneck for the entanglement and, and slows down the propagation of of entanglement across the system. So this is very nice because you can solve uh, as a function of the uh, parameter a that tunes the concentration of bottlenecks. You can solve for the entanglement growth and you find this intermediate power law behavior between zero and one. So the idea is simply to look at this same circuit but sideways. So look at the space-time dual of this particular Griffiths circuit model and the interesting thing here is that these static disordered rates, when you look at them in the dual circuit, become 
uniform but time dependent rates. So this so these bottlenecks that are you know that look like columns in this picture, if you are traversing the circuit left to right, then they correspond to special time steps where almost everything is being measured. Because if you're if you are encountering this time step as you move left to right, then almost all the bonds have this particular uh, this particular you know um, arc configurations, which as I told at the beginning, that is a dual of the identity, which is a bad measurement. So almost everything is being measured and leaving behind a very sparse network of entanglement. And um, you know uh, the same argument that you can run for the unitary evolution basically goes through here and and it gets you this fractional power loss scaling. Uh, but we can also confirm it with Clifford simulations where you get this beautiful range of power laws between zero and one as you tune this uh, parameter. And uh, okay, so I won't get into details about this, but basically, yeah, not just the mean, but also the distribution of entropy collapses onto a scaling ansatz, meaning that the entire, if you, if you look at an entanglement profile for a very large system, it is actually uh, statistically self-similar overall length scales. So it really behaves like a fractal in that, in that sense. And this is a behavior that is genetically not found in unitary many-body dynamics, where typically you reach a volume law, right? So something has to stop you from reaching a volume law, and in this case, it's the measurements. So, so injecting these non-unitary ingredients seems to enable you to create these novel kinds of, um, of entanglement scaling behavior, basically. Um, good, so I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to quickly skim over this, but basically in chaotic models, there is a beautiful analytical technique to get the growth of entanglement in time in the unitary circuit, which gets you this uh, ballistic growth with, a, with an analytically computable entanglement velocity. And we can adapt this construction to our problem in which we have edge decoherence. And this construction gets modified in, a, in an interesting way. So you have this random walker. And because of this particular boundary condition, there is a loss of probability that manifests in this power law factor, it's a square root that typically arises you know, in, in random walks. And it gets you this universal one half log L correction, which is the subleading non thermal uh, correction to the entanglement. Um, so, right, so, so two things. One is that the entanglement entropy density in this, in this phase equals the entanglement velocity in the unitary circuit, which is again a consequence of the space time duality mapping where you're exchanging space and time. So entropy per unit length becomes entropy per unit time. Uh, but then you have this peculiar non-thermal volume law correction, which again comes from the, from the decoherence uh, aspect of, of this. And uh, quickly, uh, I should say that when we posted this, we, we, you know, we had this calculation for the one half log L, but it turns out that this depends on having a subsystem that's near an edge. And if you instead pick a subsystem that's in the bowl of an infinite system, an infinite chain that's you know, infinite on both sides, uh, this actually changes to a three halves log L uh, correction to the entanglement, uh, which is the same as what is found in more general um, unitary measurement circuits in the, in the volume of phase and suggests that this phase that we get in the duals of chaotic circuits may actually be the same phase as the one that's found there. Uh, this is by no means like, uh, a short sure thing, but it appears, you know, it's consistent to the extent that we've been able to test it uh, with some evidence that, that's still a little inconclusive. But yeah, that's, if confirmed, this will be a, 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 an exact microscopic realization of these effective theories that people have put forward to derive this universal law correction in the, in the volume law phase. And uh, I'm sort of out of time, so I'm just going to quickly flash this, but Basically, this kind of entanglement is actually something, something you can measure in the lab without any post-selected or decoded measurements. And this is something we discussed in actually a previous paper that came out earlier this year. Um, so it turns out that this particular uh, density matrix, like the reuse density matrix for, for um, this kind of entanglement computation, where you have a subsystem in, in the bulk of an infinite system, reduces to a density matrix that has this particular funny boundary conditions we call light combinatory conditions here. Uh, and that is actually measurable through a protocol that I won't go into details, but it's like a sequence of uh, simple, you know, state preparation, unitary gates, measurements, and then conditional on the outcome, you know, uh, continue or stop, and then, you know, record how many times you finish versus how many times you, you fail. And um, a ratio of successful runs to total runs gets you exactly the purity of this reduced density matrix, and therefore gets you the entanglement in of a subsystem in this 
dual steady state. Okay, so I think I'm at the half hour mark, so I'm just gonna flash my conclusions. Basically, uh, space and duality lets us um, build these interesting non unitary circuits where, on the one hand, we have uh, analytical control and some physical intuition, and on the other hand, they have this uh, alternative experimental uh, avenues to be realized uh, as opposed to other um, unitary measurement circuits. And, uh, and with these circuits, we can engineer this interesting zoo of out of equilibrium states that exhibit this rich variety of entanglement scaling, including these novel fractals. And, uh, and then, of course, questions for future work abound. So it's just a matter of how many more interesting things can we derive from, from these and, and other ideas in this direction. So with this, uh, thank you for your attention, and, and I'll take any questions. And thank my collaborators and the organizers. Thanks. Thanks for being on time. Any questions? <clears throat> Should I look at people who are <laughs> unmuted? Well, you should just unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay. Well, if we don't have any questions, maybe soon one. I think you're next. Do you wanna do you wanna ask a question? I think you're asking me to ask question. <laughs> no, I no, I don't have any question. We chatted about this work in private yeah. a lot. So yeah. Yeah. I, I have one question. Go for it. Yeah, so this case, uh, this model you showed that has the the steady state uh, power law entanglement. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, well, I guess it, it seems a little confusing because the, uh, you know, it's sort of time dependent and, you know, mm -hmm. again, evolving in the non-unitary direction. So it doesn't reach a steady state, right? It's like the average yeah. entanglement is power law, but it doesn't, ever reach a fixed steady state you know sometimes that's, it's that's right entanglement is much less and sometimes it's much more depending on when these random measurements happen mm -hmm. with um so i'm wondering whether you could make a model um that's non-unitary that actually does reach a steady state you know a fixed steady state yeah. with this parallel entanglement yeah so two things about that one is that's kind of a general feature of these uh unitary measurement circuits they never reach a steady state it's just an ensemble of, of states that that keep bouncing around because of the measurements. And the question is, what about the values of various observables of interest? And so here, you're right that this bounces very strongly. And But the steady distribution you get looks like this, where you, you do have a power law tail to very low entanglement, which, as you can imagine, is right after a very severe bottleneck. You've destroyed almost everything, and you're kind of at the, at the bottom yeah, of the right. power law tail. But as a whole, the distribution scales that like collapses onto this power law ansatz. So even even if you're not at the mean, you kind of you're aware of, of, of the scaling. Yeah, yeah, I see. Um, but the second thing um, I wanted to say, okay, so so yeah, there's there's some weird stuff in the literature, <laughs> I should say. Uh, yeah, I guess these aren't. Yeah, that's not here. So um, there's some driven driven non-unitary CFD stuff, which is really esoteric, but they get actual fractals, like clean fractals, like a, uh, you know. Uh, okay. What, what is it, a uh, Sierpinski carpet or something? I don't know, it's like weird, weird profiles, uh, but but that is, I have no idea how you would realize that, so. Okay, cool, so, yeah, that, that was a very informative answer, thanks. Yeah, thank you, good question. Can, can, can you scroll up to your uh, last couple of slides? I just wanted, I saw a picture that sound looked, yeah, like for example, this one. Um, mm -hmm. Do I understand, I, I'm a little bit confused because I thought, here because the um the uh, because you're going sideways the circuit is non-unitary is that correct yeah so if you're going sideways um yeah. these gates have their little arrow that's going up but you're, you're going sideways so that right not right so so, you. so so is so maybe i misunderstood sort of uh, the size of the problem so if i have in mind uh the uh the vertical if you like the time delay i don't know some finite number 10 Mm -hmm. Is the statement that somehow the tensor network that I have to compute here is roughly 10 by 10? Yes, that's correct. In fact, okay. it's, it's a little smaller. I mean, it's this triangle that's like yeah, yeah, no, but, right. five or whatever, but yes, yes. And, and uh, the, but the reason for that is because 
you have unitarity in this direction. So that yes, and it's only true in the thermodynamic limit. Like there is a cancellation that, or that becomes exact in the thermodynamic limit, but is otherwise approximate. I think it's an upper bound generically. I see. Okay. So, so it's not exact at, for finite T. For finite systems, it's, it's not exact. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and okay. the, the physically, the issue is you have information that's, let me go back to some place here. Yeah, you have information that crosses this cut here. And it has to go up because of unitarity. But if you have a finite system, it has a chance of hitting the top and turning back around, right. going backwards in time and entering right. your system again. And then it's not exact. Right. Only when you send the top to infinity, then you're guaranteed to basically leave the system through, through, the, through the complement and then, and then the mm -hmm. cancellation becomes exact. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. So I should think of it as somehow time, you know, what one can reframe this in the language of time averaging somehow maybe the time average okay anyway i'll i, I yeah i, I think I you answered my question i'll <laughs> i'll stop there i'll quit while i'm ahead oh, good. okay that was a good good question okay any more questions um yes i have a small question um so do you have any comments uh what happens if you impose for example lorentz symmetry because if you have a lorentz and field theory and you know just in minkowski space time and you flip time and space, yeah. nothing much should happen. Yeah, so if you have like a free free boson, just so like d t squared minus d x squared, that is actually dual unitary in the sense that like these works had considered. So <clears throat> yeah, so if you have a unitary circuit, you can also ask about its dual and you can impose it to be unitary. And that's a fine tuned condition, but it's, it's you can do it. And those have very special behavior, like correlations exist only on the light cone, like strictly on the surface of the light cone, but not inside. And that's, you know, the free boson does have that, uh, you know, that green function that's just on the light cone. So it's kind of, but then if you, if you put in a mass term that that breaks it. So, so yeah, I don't know beyond that. Uh, yeah, but naively free, free boson is not, uh, is not chaotic. Yeah, because it's because it's free. So 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 those circuits kind of generalize that to they, they preserve that property, but they can also put in interactions. I don't know how to do that in a continuum field theory, but maybe maybe it's possible. Um, so uh, it, it just my my question is: um, you you have this nice scale between MBL and uh, dual unitary. So if I consider just a free boson, like where would it be on this on this scale? Oh yeah, I guess it's not. It's nowhere. So in some sense, the only free point there is the Anderson localization. But obviously, like a clean free boson is not, you know, localized. So it would fit nowhere here. Obviously, this is kind of a there's multiple dimensions could we, to this. And could we call it an example of dual unitary, but not on the other end of the chaotic spectrum, but just you know, ah, yeah. it's, Maybe it's, it's, kind it's of like dual a, unitary, but but the like more integrable or free versions of dual unitary, right? It's like a horseshoe. It's like all the way to a unitary, but then it comes back to free. Tie it back like that, I guess. Okay, I see. Thank you. You know, you as a horseshoe. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> okay. Any yeah, more yeah, questions? You. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Um, our next speaker is Sun Won Choi. Yes. Right. Uh, let's let's get started. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me this amazing opportunity to talk about my recent work. This is basically the first time that I talk about this work in the community. Um, <clears throat> and before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators. And the, this is a combination of theory and experiment. On the theory side, uh, I would like to thank the Jordan Calder and Daniel Mark, who is a first year graduate student at MIT, and Robert Huang, uh, he's a graduate student at, at Caltech, and also experimentalist Junhee Adam, uh, working in Manuel's, Manuel Andrews group. Uh, but today's talk will be mostly theoretical, and only towards the end, I'll briefly mention the experimental relevance. So let's get started. <clears throat> So I would like to start by celebrating the statistical physics. Here we talk about physics of many particles, as many as like Avogadro number of particles and their collective macroscopic behavior. And those behaviors are often like universal. What's amazing is this statistical physics gives us the power to make a very accurate prediction. In other words, it's very useful. So what are the examples? The examples include quantum or classical thermalization or quantum or classical phase transitions, 
And more recently, uh, statistical physics, or more specifically, uh, thermodynamics has provided a lot of new insight to understand the black hole information paradox. Actually, they are the leading uh, guiding principles for their research. Because it's so important, we want to understand why and how does a statistical physics work so well in generic systems. And this answer is obviously very hard. Uh, uh, and then I don't know the answer and that's not what I'm gonna do today, but I can explain what's like well accepted in the classical many body system, which is in keyword like the chaos. Consider two many bodies initial state that is slightly different from one another by just maybe perturbing one particle. And if they undergo a nonlinear uh, complex many body dynamics, what happens is after later time, they reach completely different configuration, so-called butterfly effect. And this effect has a, a lot of consequence to the, the emergence of statistical behavior. In practice, we never know perfect initial state. We always have a little bit of uncertainty or misinformation about the initial state. We can treat them as if it's a number of small perturbations. And what that means is uh, this time evolution is effectively amplifying those uncertainties such a way that the late time the, uh, configuration is essentially random. But what's very interesting is this randomness is completely uniformly random up to all conserved quantities forming a universal ensemble, such as canonical ensemble or grand canonical ensemble or Gibbs ensemble. And it's independent of the microscopic details of the initial state and only depend on the extensive variables like volume, temperature, chemical potential. So this logical flow, the chaotic dynamics Loss, loss of information, and then more importantly, the emergence of this universal random ensemble is what governs the validity of the statistical physics in the classical settings. How about quantum settings? If you want to directly generalize this uh, intuition to the quantum settings, we all know that doesn't work. And that's because our uh, Schrodinger's equation is a linear differential equations. And if you perturb a little bit, the small perturbation remains small under unitary evolution. Instead, we have uh, two different approaches, closely related two different approaches to understand quantum chaos and thermalization. One approach is using quantum entanglement. Even if we have a globally pure many body wave function with the zero entropy, if you only look at the subsystem, the subsystem may exhibit some entropy due to entanglement entropy with the rest of the system. Furthermore, the reduced density matrix of the subsystem may look like a thermal state thereby resolving this paradox of uh, emergence of randomness. Here, the information loss is essentially coming from the non-locality of the, uh, the correlation, which is basically entanglement. Another approach is random matrix theory based approaches, like, like various conjecture or more advanced version of it, like uh, eigenstate thermodynamic hypothesis. Here, the spirit is slightly different. We take this many body Hamiltonian and diagonalize it and look at each eigenstate and eigenvalues. And what this approach believes is as a conjecture, we assume that those proper, many properties of eigenstates and eigenvalues uh, looks like uh, that of random uh, uh, ensembles, like as if the Hamiltonian is drawn from a GOE or GOE, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and that has a very strong predictive power. And these two approaches has a pros and cons. The first approach is very intuitive and it provides a good explanation of how quantum thermalization could work. However, it has a less of predictive power because it does not explain why it should work. On the other hand, our random matrix theory based approach gives a very strong predictive power based on the random, literally random matrix theory results. However, here the emergence of randomness is posed as a conjecture and we never explain the origin of this randomness. What I'm going to talk about today, uh, it's a little bit in between the two. So today I'm going to provide a new perspective that's in between the two, or maybe build a bridge between the two. Uh, and I want to call it the emergent random ensemble. And the key insight of this, uh, this approach is that to realize, recognize that a single many body wave function could encode a random ensemble of pure state. And we, are, we investigated this random, uh, these approaches and then actually found more, uh, more interesting phenomena, namely that uh, we found that those ensemble approaches and the approaches to a certain universal ensemble on the broad range of cases. And we analyze it by using, our, uh, using the tool set in quantum information theory called the quantum state K design that I'm going to talk about today. Finally, this universal phenomena 
uh, has been utilized to design a new practical applications. And this application has been already applied to existing uh, analog quantum simulator based on the Rithbell outcomes and Caltech. And, and towards the end of the talk, I'll briefly talk about this application. So with that in mind, let's start from the, the first topic, like immersion random ensemble. So here is a question. Suppose we are given a many body wave function psi. It could be a output of some quantum circuit, or it could be obtained by time evolution of certain initial state under Hamiltonian evolution, or it could be an energy eigenstate of a certain Hamiltonian. And we ask ourselves how random this quantum state is. However, this question is actually not well defined. And let's take an analog. Like suppose I'm given a bit string, like 0, 01010000. 0, 0, 0, 0. Right. We can ask whether this bit string is random or not. And this question is now well defined because given a single string, there's no notion of randomness. Only when, if we're drawing a variable from a certain ensemble, then we can talk about the randomness. Therefore, talking about the randomness for a single wave function doesn't sound like a good idea. However, in quantum mechanical problem, we have a, a, a connection between random, natural connection between randomness, uh, which is a measurement. So the key idea is we starting from a single wave function, we are going to generate an ensemble of quantum state by performing measurements. For example, suppose we have a many body wave function of spins of qubits dividing to two parts A and B. Generally, A is small subsystem and B is large subsystems, rest of the systems. And consider performing local projective measurements on part B. And we'll get some measurement outcomes, say 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then unmeasured wave function on A will stay remain in a pure state, but that may depend on the measurement outcome. If you repeat the same uh, experiment and then get the different measurement outcome on B, we'll get the different pure state on part A. In fact, if there's an NB number of qubits in part B, we'll have a exponentially many uh, pure quantum state on A. And naturally they cannot be orthogonal to one another if the subsystem size A is sufficiently small. And we call this uh, the set of wave functions weighted by the probability of getting all these different measurement outcome as a, well, uh, I define it as a projective ensemble. <clears throat> so in this way, starting from a quantum wave functions, we could generate an ensemble of wave functions defined on the subsystem. And now that we have an ensemble, we, now we can talk about statistical properties of them. <clears throat> and uh, we can already start, talk about statistical physics essentially. Uh, so what is the important like statistical properties? Maybe the, the most intuitive one is calculating mean value or average value. For example, we take the wave function psi and the cat bra and calculate the probabilistic average over all those probability PZ. And this quantity is nothing but the reduced density matrix of the subsystem. If you know that the original quantum state is drawn from say time evolved state or the eigenstate of a certain Hamiltonian dynamics, we know that this row A, the reduced density matrix, will uniformly converge to the former density matrix of the subsystem, regardless of the microscopic details of the original quantum material wave functions. So what it means is in terms of projective ensembles, we have just learned that the average, the mean of our projective ensemble converges to the universal value. But how about if we look at the other quantities like a second moment, so we raise to the power two, and then average, so we get the second moment of the wave functions or the third moment of the wave function or generally case the moment of wave function. And it'll be very curious to look at what happens for those higher moments. More generally, we can ask more broad questions like how uniformly random the quantum state ensemble is spread over the entire Hilbert space. And turns out this is a defining feature, almost a defining feature of this notion quantum state K design uh, that's introduced in quantum information theory. So let's take a, a little bit of detour and then talk about quantum state K design. The formal definition of the quantum state K design is the following. An ensemble of quantum states is called a quantum state K design if all statistical properties up to the case moment match with the Ha random ensemble. The Ha random ensemble is just uni completely uniform continuous ensemble of the entire Hilbert space. But I find this definition is too technical and like uh, and hard to penetrate. So in my wording, I would just say it just measures how uniformly random an ensemble is over the entire Hilbert space. In fact, it's very easy to understand with the examples. So let's consider a single qubit Hilbert space. And we consider a particular ensemble 
where this wave function could be either polarized up zero or polarized down one with the probability 50-50. Um, this ensemble, if you take the average of the ensemble, that's in the, the middle point of the block sphere. So it's a, it's a maximal limit state from this and which matches with the average of the whole Hilbert space. And therefore we say this particular ensemble forms one design. However, if you look at the variance of these wave functions and they does not form, uh, the, it does not agree with the high random. Therefore this, this ensemble does not form two design. One way to check is the following. Let's look at the expectation value along x, the x polarization. For both states, the x expectation value is zero. So the variance is zero. However, if you average over all block sphere, we know the variance is non-zero. Likewise, the variance along z is too large compared to the variance of r. So we see that the, the second moment is not, uh, so this ensemble is not a second, uh, does not form two design. In fact, um, <clears throat> Uh, if you have a four state distributed like this, the corners of the, hetero, the tetrahedron, then not only the mean value agrees, but also the second moment agrees, but it does not agree the third moment. So in this case, it equals like two design, but not three design. Uh, if you have a, eight sta a six state, you have a three designs and the more state you can have four design. And in order to form a high random ensemble, we need a continuum number of state, infinite number of states. So what we learn from this is that essentially forming a high K design means it's more uniformly and densely random in the Hilbert space. These concepts can be generalized to the many body case. So let's, so I cannot draw the Hilbert space, but let me draw like cartoon. So let's say we have a many body Hilbert space of N qubits. If you consider a randomly spread two to the N, like the basically the dimension of the Hilbert space state, they form approximate one design. It's not perfect unless it's fine-tuned, but approximate one design. If you have a two to the two n random state, you form an approximate two design. If you have two to the k n random state over the whole Hilbert space, then we have approximate k design. And having more number, having more state is not sufficient to form a, to form a k design because it could be that there are many states, but uh, kind of concentrated on the certain part of the Hilbert space, and then we don't say it has a, it's a design. More mathematically, how to check you know, whether ensemble forms a K design or not. So we calculate the case moment, you raise the wave function to the power of K and then average over the ensemble and that's the moment state. And we compare this moment state with the corresponding value uh, evaluated for the perfect high distributions and then measure the distance. And if the distance is zero, it's a perfect K design. If distance is sufficiently small, it's approximate K design. So coming back to our picture, so we talked about how this different wave function could lead to a projected ensemble for a certain subsystem. And we talked about the mean value approaches to the, the your universal value independent of the microscopic details of the initial state. And what I'm going to argue for the rest of the talk is that if you look at the second, third or case moment, they also converge to a universal value and that's the high random value. This is not always true, but we believe this is true if the initial wave function is in some sense like a high, the infinite temperature case. And we claim that uh, therefore this is the immersion ensemble forms approximate K design. So we provide a number of uh, numerical simulations to verify our work. And then we also have an analytic and solvable results, which I'll talk about later. So let's start from numerical simulations. So for example, you just consider this canonical ergodic Hamiltonian model, like transverse field Ising model in the presence of longitudinal field. What we did is we consider the initial state where all qubits are polarized up and then time evolve them under this unitary evolution and then obtain a wave function and divide into subsystem A. And uh, uh, yeah, this, this initial state is chosen in such a way that the energy density belongs to the infinite temperature so that the, the time evolved state is supposedly at infinite temperature locally. We divide into the part A and B and then perform measurement on B to generate a projected ensemble. Then we compute the case moment of the ensemble and check the distance to the, the expected behavior from the high ensemble. And what I'm going to plot is this delta as a function of time. So here's a numerical simulation results. So Y axis is the delta in log scale and X axis is a time in log scale different curve corresponds to different system sizes. So what we see is that this delta is decreasing uh, until it saturate uh, and, and saturation value depends on the system size. 
And if you plot the saturation value as a function of system size, we see that it's exponentially decaying. What it means is in the thermodynamic limit, uh, this delta goes to zero. Um, furthermore, uh, if we can compare how close it is, so we can actually sample from high random a finite number of samples and consider the distance to the high random, and that actually captures the statistical noise flow associated with a finite number of samples. It seems like our distance is almost as close as those true high random state. Um, and this is a feature, uh, uh, and also this is a feature of the, the chaotic dynamics. If you actually simulate the transverse field Ising model, we don't get this behavior. And so far, this observation shouldn't be that surprising because for k equal 1, we are talking about basically reduced density matrix. And what it means is the reduced density matrix indeed converges to the maximal unique state at infinite temperature state, which is all known and it's associated with the quantum thermalization. What's interesting is the behavior at the higher moment. If you look at the second moment, it also behaves qualitatively the same behavior. And also the third moment and fourth moment all those properties has a saturation value that's exponentially decaying system sizes. And as far as I know, this property is a new uh, phenomena and cannot be explained by the conventional theory of thermalization. So we studied a little further than that. So what we studied is, okay, we wanted to know how long it takes to form a high K design. And to, to capture that, we put some threshold, uh, 0.02, and then see, uh, we calculated uh, what is the minimum time uh, uh, that required to reach that value for the distances. And we call it the design time. And it seems like this design time as a function of K is generally increasing. That means achieving higher K or the higher K is more uniformly spreading over the Hilbert space takes longer time. Uh, I personally believe that this is related to the complexity growth. However, as for now, we don't have any like concrete proof or evidence to directly relate them. I think this is a very interesting future direction. So I wanted to visualize what's happening. So let's say the single subsystem A is actually made out of a single qubit. And I'm plotting this uh, projected ensemble uh, in the block sphere as a function of time to visualize what's going on. And it looks like this. So we see that the initially uh, up state uh, and we have exponentially many uh, different states that is rapidly spreading over the entire block sphere and filling in and then densely covering the whole block sphere and then eventually become yeah. uniformly distributed. Okay. So the next example we tried in the numerical simulation is energy eigenstate. Uh, the same Hamiltonian, now we diagonalize the Hamiltonian and calculate, uh, they get some eigenstate and then generate the projective ensemble and compute the case moment and check the convergence to the K design. And here's the result with the Y axis is the distance to the K design and axis, axis is the energy eigenvalue normalized by system sizes. Uh, what we see that is for first moment and not only the first moment but second moment and third moment, the distance is minimized at the zero energy and the zero energy is basically where the local temperature goes to infinite temperature. And if you actually zoom in this zero energy regime and then show the convergence, average convergence as a function of system size, we again see the exponential decay. And we indeed see this convergence for all K moments that we have studied. So basically we find this universal property uh, also in the eigenstate beyond the thermalization. So, so far we talked about quench dynamics and energy eigenstate of the mixed field IC model. But we believe, we believe this is more generally true. We also did a numerical simulation of geometrically non-local model and also in the presence of the symmetry and also the Floquet dynamics where there's no energy conservation. Uh, also, we developed uh, the Sobobo model. So any random quantum circuit, we can rigorously prove that if the projected ensemble from the typical output of quantum state forms a K design. And also we have a Sobobo time independent Hamiltonian evolutions uh, and this is constructed by the idea of measurement based quantum computation. And also, we established two theorems. Um, it's actually it's a very technical and a heavy quantum information, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But the theorem basically says this if you randomly pick one wave function from a Hilbert space and fix it, and for that particular wave function, we generate a projective ensemble, and we show that that projective ensemble actually forms approximate K design. Um, so we believe that this, uh, so basically we have a proof that this property is generic, uh, is true for the generic and many physical uh, many body wave functions. 
The one can ask a question. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, is this projected ensemble, how is it related to sort of the more standard one, thing one does by generating a reduced density matrix by tracing over part of the system? Yeah, yeah. If you take the projective ensemble, it's an ensemble of state that's mutually non, potentially non orthogonal. If you take the mean value of that, and that's the, the reduced density matrix. So basically, reduced density matrix is the mean of this projective ensemble. I see. If you average over those states, then I see. Yeah. That's tracing it over. Okay. Exactly. That's tracing. Yeah, exactly. We are not tracing over, but projecting. So that's the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Any other quick questions? All right. Then let's that's, move on. I did have a question to follow up. Yeah. You said you, if you took the average of the projected ensembles, you would, you would get the, the reduced like the you would effectively you'd get the some moment of the reduced density matrix is that is that true just for the 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 second moment or is that true for all moments oh so okay so reduced density matrix okay so i i understand where it's coming from the reduced density matrix is a point so you see this block block sphere reduced mm -hmm. density matrix is the point in this block sphere which is at the center so it, we do not talk about the, the moment of it what I mean by that is there's a multiple ways to have an ensemble of pure state whose mean is at the center. So already at the short time, at this point, if you take the average of that, that's in the middle point of the block sphere. So it's a maximally mixed state. However, their distribution over the block sphere is not yet uniform enough to form the higher K design. Did it answer your question? Um, uh, yes, thank, thank you. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, at this point. Sorry, so I, I just uh, want to follow up again. So yeah. the, re the reduced density matrix from some pure state that you take out of your Hilbert space, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily going to give you a K design. Well, what can you say about sort of the stand? From the point of your K design, what can you say about a reduced density matrix for some arbitrary state that you pick out? Generic. Oh, I see. If an ensemble forms a K design, it automatically implies that the reduced density matrix is maximally mixed. I see. Infinite temperature. Infinite temperature, yeah. I see. Thank you. And that's but, a nice bridge to this slide. What about finite yeah. temperature? Sorry, but not in the other direction, right? So in other words, not every infinite temperature state is a K design. You're absolutely right. Every ensemble whose mean is infinite temperature or the, whose mean is maximally mixed does not imply it, uh, it forms a K design, high design. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but so far we've been talking about infinite temperature, but how about finite temperature? As, as far as I know, there's no like mathematical notion of this K design for the finite temperature case. So we cannot check whether it converges to the, the particular thermal K design if it exists or not. But instead, we can check whether it converges to a particular ensemble or not by just picking up the eigenstate and then compute the pairwise distance and plot it as a function of energy difference, uh, as a pair of energy. And what we see is along the diagonal that's like blue and dark, that means whenever we took the two eigenstates from the same energy, they generate the same ensemble. And indeed, we see the exponential decay along those diagonal, suggesting that actually numerically, uh, there exists a universal, the temperature dependent ensemble, even for higher moment, not only the reduced density matrix, but also the K equal two design, we have some universal ensemble approaching. So that was the first part of my talk. And then I want to spend some remaining five minutes uh, explaining how we can utilize this kind of universal behavior in order to design a practical applications uh, and, uh, that's implemented in the ripple Latin simulator. So let's just switch the gear. Uh, we now know that there are many promising uh, platforms. Um, Crystal already talked about trapped ion systems, but we do have superconducting qubits. Actually, Miles talked about superconducting qubit systems. And we also have a ripple atom array and many others. The property of devices are that uh, that they are in general noisy, not perfect. And their size is not like thousand or million, but like a 10 to hundred. And they have a limited controllability. Arbitrary gate is a little bit expensive.
expensive to implement. And this regime is so-called uh, noise intermediate uh, scale quantum devices, so-called NISC devices. And one of the challenges that we need to address in order to make these devices useful is to you know, carefully calibrate and then characterize them, so-called the device benchmarking. So ideally, we want to start from a simple initial state zero and then do some unitary evolution to obtain some desired quantum state size zero. In reality, we do have some error and imperfection so that we either pre prepare different psi, different wave function, or like some mixed state. Our job is to carefully calibrate the system. And to do that, we need to estimate what is the many body fidelity between the experimentally prepared state row one and the ideal like wave function size zero. However, this task is not so easy. How would you actually measure this many body fidelity or even estimate it, especially when we only have a limited control to the experimental system? So let me illustrate the difficulty by talking about some naive approach related to the quantum state tomography. So you prepare some experimental state row one and measure every qubit in three different bases, x, y, z. And there are three to the n different bases choices. And for each basis choice, we need to measure sufficiently many enough so that we accumulate the probability distribution so that we can, uh, we can read, you know, like do the tomographic task uh, at the two to the n measurement. In total, we have a six to the n measurement to give you some sense already for the 10 qubits that Crystal described today, we need the 10 to the eight measurements. And if the, each measurement takes one second, it totally takes like two years, which is just out of the scope. Furthermore, this task requires us to apply the single qubit rotations individually to every qubit. And we assume that those fidelities are perfect. So in practice, this kind of full state tomography is too uh, very expensive. And then we don't, do, we, we don't think we're going to do that. So instead, we are proposing a new approach. And actually, there are also other approaches. So, so please read the papers if you're interested in. Um, for the time limit, I'm only going to talk about our protocol. Uh, it's based on uh, basically many body quantum chaos. And the protocol is actually extremely simple. On the experimental side, what we do is we prepare some simple initial state, all zero, and evolve them under natural evolution of their analog quantum simulator. It doesn't matter what this chaotic evolution is, as long as it's not integrable and it's sufficiently chaotic in some loose sense. Um, so just any experimentalist should choose whatever the natural one that they can do and they can do best. And then measure in the basis, a single basis that's most natural for them. Um, if you perform measurement, you will get a this string, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Repeat the same experiment, you will get a different this string and accumulate the bit strings as many as possible. And this number of bit string n may not be exponentially large. It is sufficient to have maybe 100 or 1,000. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, on the classical part, uh, we, we have a classical counterpart. Where in the, using the classical computer, we exactly simulate the ideal behavior that we want to achieve and evaluate what's the probability to obtain each bit string using the classical computer. And this is going to be pretty expensive if the quantum system is very large and that's going to the bottleneck and the uh, of our protocol. And once we do the calculation, we compute the following quantity FC, where uh, this P1Z is a probability to obtain that bit string Z from the experiment and P0Z is the probability to obtain the same string from the ideal theory. And this quantity can be experimentally measured pretty efficiently by sampling and then evaluating this, aver averaging this quantity over experiment where this bit uh, string is, uh, is using from the, the experimentally measured bit strings. And our claim is this FC, quant uh, the value is uh, it's a very good unbiased estimator for the, the many body fidelity. In this approach, we can sample only a small number of bit strings. So it's a very sample efficient. In other words, the number of measurement you need to do is very small. Uh, however, it requires, as I said, the expensive classical computations. But for the NISC devices of like say n equal 10 or n equal 12, this will be still manageable. And uh, in that sense, uh, we believe this protocol is well suited for the NISC devices. So uh, how does it work? So I'm, going, I'm not going to explain how it works uh, in details, but I maybe sketch the intuitions based on our first part of the talk, the universal statistics of emergent random state. In the experiment, we are measuring all these strings. 
Well, artificially, let you divide them into a small part A and like large part B, and then consider them measuring sequentially. So let's say only measure B, and at that point, the wave function on A will be a random uh, wave function according to our answer, our claim, which is one of the particular state in the projected ensemble. And if this is a random state and then perform measurement, and this measurement outcome will exhibit a certain well-defined like the probability distribution, so-called the polar Thomas distributions, uh, with the well-defined mean value and when we define the variance uh, and these probability distributions are fluctuating. But it's a pattern, detail, the pattern will be very specific to the particular Hamiltonian. Uh, this is microscopic information. Uh, but if you now have an error occur on the quantum circuit, and what happens is this pattern will entirely change, even though their overall statistical property like mean or the variance will stay the same. So what we are going to do is we are comparing the correlation between the two different speckle patterns, or these kind of random patterns. So if there's a small amount of error, the experimental probabilities and the theoretical probabilities will generally correlate it a lot. But when there's a lot of error, the, the uh, not correlation is gone. Actually, this bottom right corners is actually the data from the experiment. Uh, in this way, uh, what, what we design is we design this FC to measure and quantify the correlations. And the claim is this FC correlation is approximate to the, the device fidelity. And this relation is actually not a just handy wave argument that we can, we can derive it with a few lines. And there's a two approximate sign. And this one of the approximate relies on our universal random statistics. Uh, and the second approximate signs uh, depends on the operator growth of the editor operator. Uh, and then because we are only relying on this universal property, we believe that this method is applicable for almost all platforms where we can do this chaotic dynamics. So this idea has been already implemented in using the ripple atom simulators uh, by, by group at Caltech. And here's the result. The y-axis is the many body fidelity that we estimate as a, uh, and x-axis is the time of the crunch dynamics they have simulated. And then gray point measures the the FC between the model we believe and the experimental data. Um, and we see that it decays over maybe like three or four microseconds. And if you plot the theoretical prediction of how entanglement entropy changes across the cut in the middle, we see this rapidly increases. So it's, uh, it's a very long time compared to the entanglement dynamics. And this pink data, uh, pink line is the our ab initio error model for the system compared to the, our uh, uh, the theory uh, without error, like a theory model without error. And this F value is an ab initial uh, model, error model with uh, the model without error. So the fact that F and FC agrees almost perfectly implies that even for our FC uh, is a good estimator for the true many body fidelity. So here we cannot plot the true many body fidelity because experimentally measuring it is impossible. So from this point of view, we, we, we claim that uh, we have essentially uh, estimated the fidelity without performing the full tomography. So this is the last slide of my talk. Uh, so the, to summarize, we talked about the projected ensemble and immersion quantum state K design arising from a, a lot of uh, wave functions. And then we talked about how to utilize it as a quantum device benchmarking. The take home message that I hope to deliver is that we wanted to provide a new perspective to study quantum chaos. And we found universal properties beyond conventional thermalization uh, uh, manifested in the higher moments. And I wanted to uh, emphasize that this kind of universal property can be used to design a novel like quantum applications. Oh. Thank you very Thank much. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Sunwan. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Please go ahead. I think you put put it already in chat, but maybe. Yeah, that's it. Worth, worth repeating. Well, just go ahead. Just ask so I have a, yeah, simple question. Are there practical methods to generate K designs numerically? Uh, that's actually a very important uh, open question. Not, I, I'm not, um, so that's actually a very active research direction in quantum information science. Um, uh, if you have a Clifford evolution, 
it's believed to uh, form a, a two design and a three design, however, not four design, and systematically generating high k design for k larger than or equal to four seems like a hard problem. And I, we don't know how to do that. Uh, however, if you have a random unitary circuit uh, where individual gate is drawn from high random, uh, it's believed that the global circuit will form approximate K design if the depth is sufficiently deep. Okay, so here K will depend on the depth. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. If I had a question, and I'm sorry if I missed, you talked about it, but I missed it. So if you're at finite temperature, well, I, I guess it's one of the outlooks in your slide. Uh, if you're at finite temperature, is there, what is the characterization? K design by itself is not sufficient because you're not, you probably be not even K1 design, right? That's one right. So K equal one design is okay. Okay, the K equal one case is there's still the reduced density matrix. So we match the reduced density matrix to the thermal ensemble, E to the minus beta H. Um, so K equal one is kind of special and then it's easy to do. The question is how to generalize to K equal two and three. And that's the reason why we have a picture of Daniel Mark here. So he's a, he's a very you know, smart graduate student at, uh, at MIT and then he's actually working on this. Uh, so we don't have a results to present uh, at the conference level, but we do have some promising results about how to generalize this notion uh, or like notion of K-design in the, in the context of finite temperature thermal state. Right, but, but it's still not, even for K equals one, it's not defined at finite temperature, it's not hard random. So it's not, you somehow, you're saying it's, if you would find a temperature, then, oh, you know, yeah. So, yeah, okay. the way you define K design, it's not one design. In yeah, the that's right. yeah, that's right. So finite temperature, it does not go one design, but we need to define the analog of one what? design for the thermal state. You just, and, you, you just measure yeah. closer to the thermal state. I see. Yeah, that's right. But I think the like analog of one design for the thermal case, I think it's like trivial because we can just say the thermal state. Right. Density uh, matrix. Right. Okay, thank you. Hi, Sunwan. I, very nice talk. I, I had a question about your projected ensemble. So you're constructing this essentially by projections onto a product state manifold, but, but I could construct a projected ensemble projecting onto essentially any other variational manifold. And that, that may, have you thought about what differences that might lead to in your interpretation and your construction? So are you saying what happens if you measure in a different basis or yes, normal essentially, basis? But, essentially, but um, yeah, and that basis can have correlations as well. It doesn't have to be single site basis. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like the short answer, I don't know. Well, I believe that uh, locality is important. Because you know, in some sense, the locality is a very fundamental aspect to talk about thermalization, in my view. So locality is something I want to impose. Whether it's a single site, two sites, I believe that it shouldn't change the answer too much, but I don't have a proof for that. Mm -hmm. We can also talk about the measurement basis. It's a bit subtle because here everything was at an infinite temperature. But once you go to finite temperature, and also you consider the measure, and suppose you measure energy. And then like a lot of, you know, more like, correlated correlation between the measurement outcome and the remaining wave function happens. And the analysis is a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. The reason I ask, of course, is mm -hmm. um, we had this work where we, we looked at the chaos of the projected classical dynamics. And that, that is different on different variational manifolds. So if you characterize the Lyapunov spectra of those projected dynamics, you get, they're different. And, um, um, and so if you want to say that the chaos of your quantum state is determined by this projection, that, that measure is different depending on the, on the um, sort of projective measurement that you use. As I'm not sure how you can give it a strong interpretation as the measure of the, the, the um, randomness in this quantum state. No, now, now I see your point. It's right. Like a, in fact, our, our projected ensemble depends on the subsystem. Therefore, 
we are not proving like a global property of the Hamiltonian evolutions, but mm -hmm. it's in some sense specific to the subspace. Of course, if you have a translation invariance and so on, we can talk about a typical behavior. Uh, but I, I agree with you. So like this, this, uh, this method depends on the specific uh, details of which basis to measure and which subsystem to choose. Um, in that sense, it's not the answer it's, uh, of the chaos. Uh, but maybe it's a, yeah, maybe it's a good interaction direction to see. I still believe that the universal aspect will not depend on the, those specific choices. However, like I don't have a proof of that. So, so, I mean, I guess what we've seen in the case of using a, a matrix product state manifold is, is that you can get um, some universal ratios of, of quantities, ratios with the phase space volume of, it, on, of that space onto which you're projecting. And I wonder if there could be similar things there. If, if one, by using different manifolds to project onto, one, one can nevertheless find um, things that are independent of the particular manifold you're projecting onto. Hmm. But I want to clarify one thing. Mm -hmm. at, at a certain high level, I see you're, 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 you're doing the time-dependent variation of principle, right? But mm -hmm. we are not doing that. We are, I, I know. Here, the projection is to generate an ensemble because we have a different projected measurement outcomes. So I, we are I understand not talking about the trajectory over time, but the ensemble. Uh, and so of, of course, but, um, but I think still this issue of the, the way in which your choice of, of, of manifold can imprint upon the, the information you're getting out is the same. Yeah, I agree. No, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that's a, more like a feature rather than a bug. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. I, I guess, is there time for a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Sunwan. This protocol, it, it's sort of reminiscent of, you know, these things like cross-entropy benchmarking or randomized benchmarking. Um, one of the nice one of the nice things about those protocols is you have this insensitivity to the state preparation and measurement errors. Can you, can you talk about? Yeah, yeah. So our protocol is in, in fact very similar to right. uh, the cross entropy benchmark, but, uh, but it's crucially different in the two different aspects. One is uh, what's previously believed is that we need to apply actively a random unitary to the circuit, such a way that you can measure into random basis. So that's what used to be believed. What we are saying is well, actually it turns out you don't need that right. because your chaotic dynamics will generate local randomness locally. So that's one difference. The second difference is we are generating local randomness rather than global randomness over the whole system. Therefore, our method actually works only for already for a short time where locally you have a randomness, but globally not, not yet randomness. So actually, like I, I don't have a slide on this uh, presentations, but in our paper, we present the comparison between the cross linear entropy benchmark and our method. And what, what you can see is at the short time, the, this XEV value does not work, but our value works fantastically well. Yeah, I guess my, my question was about the state preparation measurement, but maybe your, your fidelities are actually pretty low here. So you're you know, you're not sensitive to, to those errors. No, like usually like when, you know, when, we, when we worry about- yeah, Actually, do, do you mind if I interject? Uh, it was just pointed out to me that we're running half hour behind time. So uh, maybe you guys can take it up and gather. I think there's one more uh, hand raised, Oliver Lunt. Do you want to ask? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, this will just be a, a quick question then. Um, you, I, I saw briefly you had a, a graph about the, the time required to generate a quantum K-state design. Um, do you have do you have a, a sort of an idea of how this should scale with k and with system size, like the sort of depth you need to go to? Is this like polynomial in those quantities? Uh, we don't or? know yet. Okay. We don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, thanks again, Sunwon, and thanks for everybody. Thanks to everybody for asking questions and sticking around. Uh, I think it's time to go back together and spontaneously <laughs> combust. Um, okay, take care. There's another uh, symposium of this kind next uh, Friday, I should have said, but you'll get a notification on that. So see you.